um, to tonight's uh, Westminster City Council uh, workshop on water and wastewater infrastructure. And I am Heather Bergman, your facilitator for the evening, and we have many members of council here. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started as the rest of our council members join us. Here comes um, Dave. Billy, can you hook me up with the next slide, please? So, council and community, a quick reminder, here's how we got here today. We have several workshops scheduled in the ever-changing and quite dynamic schedule. Um, we met on the 8th and started our conversation about, uh, we set the stage a little bit with interest. We talked um, for the first time about community participation, which we'll circle back to tonight. And we started our discussion on water and wastewater infrastructure. And then we got interrupted because of some exciting things. Um, and so we're back. And we're resuming our wastewater and water infrastructure conversation tonight with Julie. Um, we're hoping to get through that. We have some more presentation for you and then also some time for discussion to hear your thoughts on what you've heard tonight. Um, we also did promise you that we would talk about meters tonight. So after Julie's presentation and your discussion, um, Stephen Gay is here to talk a little bit about um, the meters and all of that, hoping to answer the questions that have been raised by members of council um, and the community. Yeah, Anita? Um, Catherine Scully is on as an attendee. She needs somebody to move her over. Thank you. Doris, can you take care of that? Um, yes. So we'll talk, and then we have a follow-up discussion with, um, for you tonight, uh, also on community engagement. Uh, we promised you we would think about it some more and bring you some more um, fully fledged ideas, and we have that for you. And then again, we'll start water costs and rates, which is going to be super fun on November 5th, and wastewater costs and rates on November 17th, and then we're going to give you all time just to dig in and have ideas and considerations and all the things um, there in our newly scheduled meeting on December 15th. Really, next slide. Um, so quick reminder, uh, what you see on your screen are the themes that we have heard from community concerns and comments. We're hoping to address these in one way or another in all of our conversations over the next uh, month and a half or so. Uh, meters, which we'll tackle tonight, overall rates in comparison to other areas, that's for next meeting, tier three rate in particular, we're going to talk about that as part of the rates conversation, um, billing periods, talk about that a little bit tonight, and that can be part of your policy conversation as well, um, the amount of resources available to uh, uh, the utility department and whether rate increases are needed if they have all those resources, we're going to talk about TAPS, Again, that'll be at our next meeting. And then if you all wanna talk about considerations for rate payers in the hot summer months, that's part of your, part of your policy conversation at the next meeting. Um, Julie, let, next slide. Um, so that's that same list um, of, of community concerns that we've just assigned to these meetings. And I just wanna make sure that you all as council and the community know that we're tracking and we're trying to make sure we talk about all these high level concerns that we've heard um, from the community. Next slide, please. Um, so quick reminder, the way it goes is uh, staff has prepared an in-depth presentation trying to get at um, your specific questions that you raise in your interviews with me, um, trying to peel back some of the layers um, of information so you can really kind of look at the guts of how all the things work. Um, we've asked them to unpack their assumptions, their own expectations, their own thinking, and have started to flag some of those things for you all as policy knobs you can consider turning as part of your conversation. After Julie finishes that, we'll take your questions. Um, we had some sort of remainder questions from last time that I wanna make sure we get to, but I also wanna ask council if you could be mindful of the number and length of your questions, because um, I wanna get them answered, but I also wanna make sure we have time for that discussion, which is the juicy bit of your time together tonight, I think. Um, and just quick reminder, we're not making any policy recommendations or decisions tonight. We're just learning together and kicking around some ideas. Next slide. Um, we did ask you at the um, last conversation to identify your interests. Um, you all put those in the chat, want to call those out here for the community. Um, additionally, these are in the meeting summary. Um, and if we've missed any council, please do let us know. I uh, wanted to give you a chance to review that over the weekend, but I also suspect you had other things. So if this um, list is not complete, um, let us know. When I looked through here, what I saw is there's a lot of opportunity for common ground, a lot of overlapping interests. I didn't see any particularly competing interests that were of concern. Um, so I give this to you now just as a quick reminder that we did the exercise and we will ask you to use this as sort of a touchstone when you get to your conversation about what kind of cool ideas do you have um, for the future. The best, the bestest and the coolest of ideas will meet as many of these interests as much as possible. Um, next slide. 
Um, so just last quick reminder on our agreements about how we're going to have this conversation. When we're here together tonight, we can use first names and treat each other as people and not as physicians. So you guys can call Julie, Julie, and not Ms. Kohler, if you like. Um, and then uh, we're going to assume good intentions. Everybody here wants what's right for the city, even if you think about that differently. There's a range of views in the community. There's a range of views on council, and that's okay. Um, Cause it turns out that people disagree about things all the time and still manage to find solutions that work for folks. Um, so that's that be an optimistic component. I really hope that you can ask questions as shared understanding is how we're gonna get through this. Um, where you disagree, please do that with civility. Um, does disagreeing with you doesn't mean someone's stupid or dumb or bad. It just means they disagree and that's all right. Um, and again, the funnest part is the being creative. The, what if we did this and could we consider this? And yeah, we can do that if we also do this other thing. And we're going to try and move away both as staff and as council from nah, we can't do that because we did it once someone else did that it's a dumb idea what have you so that is the plan julie next slide so um before we jump in uh lindsay and anita and dave and rich i think you all had remainder questions um we got uh, sort of shut down last time for executive session. Do you want to tackle those now, or do you want to let Julie get through the rest of her presentation and circle back? Rich, you're cool to circle back later? Yeah, circle back, please. Lindsay, cool? Anita, Anita you're good? Dave, how about you? Thank you, sir. All right. Then, Julie, do you remember where you left off? I do. Take I it away. Up ahead. I don't want to make anybody dizzy. Unwell, but here we go. It's always fun to watch the animated slides go by ever so slowly, all the steps. This is a good reminder of all the things we talked about, though. Mm -hmm. We did the spreadsheet of tears. We did the spreadsheet of tears. We did the car analogy. And then you're getting up onto the peanut butter line. The pe remember everybody, the peanut butter line that was a good one. And then it was right about here when we were finishing up. Excellent. Here we go. So thank you all. Jumping in now, question number three. What drives the decline in water and wastewater infrastructure? The prompts were age, use, materials, and location. So on the right hand side, I've grouped age and use because in the infrastructure world, those kind of go together. Anything with a motor or moving parts ages quickly when used. Software becomes obsolete. The hardware around it could be fine, but the program obsolete needs an update. Parts become obsolete. And then my favorite industry standard useful life. I know I say that a lot but it has a lot to do in the infrastructure world with age and use. And the second grouping, materials and locations. We have certain materials in certain locations that are part of this decline answer. So on the left-hand side, I've kind of grouped some of the utility areas in like patterns. And so let's play a little matchy-matchy. I'll help you out here. The first bundle is water pipelines, reclaimed pipelines, and wastewater pipelines. Their age and use is pretty much standard industry useful life, no moving parts on the pipelines. But then this idea about materials and locations. Wastewater pipelines in particular suffer from a harsh duty environment because of the sewage as it decomposes it attacks the interior linings of pipes reclaim pipelines some of them are outdoors and so the plastic pipe will suffer from uv rays and then all of our metal pipes cast iron ductile iron westminster has a special kind of soil called corrosive it means that there are metals in the soil that attack the metal in the pipe. Those are materials in specific locations that lead to the decline of the pipes from the outside. Next one, water meters. Standard useful life, and we talk about obsolete parts. 
Stephen has an excellent presentation after mine, enough said. Pumping stations, raw water, potable water and sewage. Pumping stations have equipment with motors, moving parts. We also have software that helps start and stop the pumps when we want them to start and stop. So there are these age and use, and then industry standard useful life concepts for the building itself, pipelines inside, valves, mechanical like the pumps, I said valves, and the electrical gear. On the materials in their location, um, some of these are considered harsh duty environment. So anything in the lift station, pumping sewage, harsh duty. Sometimes in the raw water environment, grit and particles exist in the raw water. Those things are really hard on valves and pumping units. Storage tanks, industry standard useful life. In the city, we had a lot of steel storage tanks. We're moving into concrete storage tanks because the water attacks the inside of the steel. We have linings on the inside and coatings on the outside. But we get into this materials and location issue. Coatings on the outside of the tank get hit with UV rays. It degrades after a while. Hail and pitting, if it gets into the metal, it accelerates the degradation of the steel. That's why we've gone to these concrete tanks. We anticipate a longer useful life with Gregory Hill, for example, the anticipated Northridge coming up in 21 and 22, should that be accepted? And then my last big category, the treatment facility. So water and reclaimed, wastewater. And then oddly enough, the raw water system has the gamut of earthen structures all the way to pumps, head gates, and then some electrical equipment for motorized head gate operation. So with the water treatment reclaimed and wastewater, I want to talk about this harsh duty environment. These three facilities have chemicals to help do their treatment. Chemical storage, chemical pumping, all harsh duty. Even when we have materials that are designed to work with that chemical, it's still considered harsh duty and we do see a kind of advanced decline. Um, and in the raw water system, like I said, motors, moving parts, and we have motors and moving parts all over the treatment facility. So, you know, the, the nutshell answer to this question is yes, age, use, materials and location, they all contribute to the decline of our infrastructure. And the car, I was thinking about my car, I grew up in Michigan. So talking about location, the slush, the salts, the de-icing, the prolonged winter, serious degradation compared to my car in Colorado. So again, the car. Comments, discussion, questions about my response to answer three. Anita? I'm, I'm going to say this about all of this. We need a written summary of this information. There's too much to be given to us just verbally and with PowerPoints. And so I, I, this is a lot to ask us to retain, and it's a lot to ask any residents who are watching it to retain and to be able to reference in the future. So I, I'm hoping that in addition to this, I know you sent us like meeting minutes, but that's not what I'm asking for. Like I, I really am going to need each night like a crib sheet <clears throat> on this because I think it's important and you know, it's valuable enough that we're spending all of this time, but retention is important. Um, and going over all of this one time is just, it's too, I, I just don't think we'll be able to capture it all and retain it. So we can circle back to that, right, Julie? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Any questions on what you did retain from that information? Dave, go ahead. I don't have a question to kind of piggyback on Mayor Pro Tem, or I'm sorry, Anita. Now, now you got me so used to calling you by the proper name that I'm going to be doing it all night. Sorry. 
it's all great information. However, I don't think it's really needed. In my opinion, we know that things are going to break. The, the only way that I think that we need to know those kind of details is, is there a cost associated with some new technology that's going to address these concerns? I mean, I think everybody understands that the system's going to wear out for a variety of reasons. Take my job, for example. I'm in operations, IT operations. You know, we plan things from four to seven years, depending on what the component is. Um, I don't ever go and figure out how I'm going to replace that and go through, oh, well, solder points wear out and heat and moisture and like it's it's just not relevant to me, in my opinion. Maybe the rest of the group would like to hear it. Like I under I mean, it's it's useful information. But at the end of the day, we have five of these meetings and we want to get to a discussion about, yeah, we know this stuff's going to wear out. I think the useful life is important to me. Um, and and what cadence do we replace it? And those are where we actually have the discussion. So I feel like we're getting tied up, in my opinion, in, in, in details that maybe, you know, at our level of what we're trying to discuss, I don't know that they're relevant. And that very much well might be the case. These, this is on here because someone or ones of you in my interviews with you said this is information that you'd like to have. Um, but it also sounds like for this one, that was pretty straightforward and we're ready to move on. Is that right? Go ahead, Anita. My only other question, and I think you maybe got this with location, is some items are, in my imagination, and um, probably more expensive to repair, not necessarily because of what it is, but where it's located. Like if it's underground and you have to tear up the whole street and all of the that, it's that kind of encapsulated in that second tier of on the right hand side of, of the location issues. Is that right, Julie? That's exactly right, Anita. Uh, pipelines, it, it does entail the entire street and, and paving. Um, sometimes in the facilities, the treatment facilities, they weren't necessarily designed to remove something like a chemical storage tank. So that becomes an issue, but yeah. Location of construction can be an expensive proposition. Sometimes. And to Dave's point, different things wear out differently. And part of why this is relevant is because it, it does then relate to that the long term replacement plan and the associated costs and the use the peanut butter line. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you take us to the next one? Question four. What drives the schedule for repairs, upgrades, replacement for infrastructure? So up to now, we've been working through these ideas of collecting and maintaining the data. And this question suggests to me, how do we use the data to take action? And so there's many things that go into scheduling for the infrastructure. One thing I have not talked about yet is master planning. So we rely on master plans, which are typically done approximately every 10 years or individual utility areas in many cases. A good master plan will lay out what you have, what you ought to have, and how to get there. And the how to get there feeds into the scheduling for capital improvement projects and plans. On the budget aspect, Public Works works within these, the the city council, the city's plan of these two year budget cycles. And we make accommodations like this year when requested to do a one year plan. Um, internally to the city, I mentioned before, we are in the process of the 2023 long term planning cycle. We back out the anticipated two year so that we have time to work with our business operations group, all of operations talk to city council, and increasingly talk to residents about what's coming up. So that's budget. The last item that I'd like to talk about that I haven't mentioned before is this concept of level of service. In 2017, Public Works developed level of service goals for each utility area. And at a, at a high level, we take into account our perceptions of customer service expectations, a regulatory environment, and available resources. When all these cogs work together, 
it turns out a level of service that represents a degree of reliability that we desire for our utility and our assets. We start this slide because this is one where council may direct us to explore different outlooks on level of service. I wanted to share with you what our assumptions are behind some of the level of service goals. Public Works thinks our customers want to turn on the tap every single time for clean, safe, reliable drinking water. And honestly, they want to flush and forget about it, not to be too crude. We, want, we think they want expedient commutes on city streets and limited service interruptions. Also on these level of service goals, on in Trinidad Public Works, we have to meet regulatory drivers. We must meet state and federal requirements for drinking water and wastewater. Um, the city will face financial penalties if we are not in compliance. And we have city staff who are called the operators in responsible charge. That carries legal ramifications if we are out of compliance. Here's the car again. I was thinking about when I buy a car, I want a car that takes me from point A to point B and back to point A again. And if I pay for a repair, I want to see an improvement in the car's performance. I trust on the regulatory side that the manufacturer of this car will take care of the emissions and all that nonsense. I don't want to have to think about that. That's their job behind the scenes. So that's my take on the car again. Public Works internally did kind of a brainstorming. What would happen with a reduced, a relaxed level of service outlook? We think we would be delivering more frequent service interruptions. They might last longer. Our customers might experience more inconvenience on their commute particularly with pipeline breaks that tie up streets. And as a city, one might experience possible harm to the environment due to sewage spills. So circling back to scheduling, we think about level of service goals as we formulate our minimally responsible CIPs. And then Returning back to the nature of the question about schedule, I want to take a jump back to talk to you again about a couple of processes that happen after the asset database. We have a sorting function where we develop the unconstrained model. Sometimes we say, if money grew on trees, but it doesn't. But these are a list of assets that are literally at the end of useful life. It is very date driven. We follow industry standards with these dates, look at age and condition, and this unconstrained model, it would literally cost over hundred thousands of dollars per year. and does not represent a responsible way to look at the assets. So we refine the unconstrained model to a constrained model. We bring in the level of service and think about our goals, both customer and regulatory, this is where we bring in criticality, vulnerability, and risk. And you might remember that criticality thinks about public health and safety, effect on operations, environmental harm, and level of cost. And we think about the vulnerability and risk of how close is this asset or asset group to complete failure. In this unconstrained model, we prioritize the assets, we group them into projects, and this is a very budget focused list. Talk with our business operations group and we really try to dial in this minimally responsible CIP concept along with other considerations for rates and fees. And this will directly tie into our future workshops. So back to this bubble picture. Those are the items that really drive the schedule for our repairs. Okay. 
Do you have any discussion, comments, or questions on this response? Anita, go ahead. Are you, yeah, are you mutey? No, now you're unmuted. I'm you're not good. mutey. I just wasn't called on, so I was waiting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, so I just wanted to ask, so going through what you just did, um, the budget proposal that we received in 2018 that took effect in 19 and 20 was a constrained model balancing our budget, um, that level of service, and then the, the prioritizations. Is that, is that correct? Yes. And the variables that could have policy implications is really just that level of service. Is that the, the correct level of service that we want? Is I'm trying to figure out what part of that is more qualitative in nature. Yes, looking back, council could have decided on a different level of service that would have impacted the budget. Um, I believe that was the that was the time frame in which my colleagues presented to council over the summer months some very heavy duty sessions, kind of the precursor to these. Um, and council chose the path that we are on right now. But going forward, that's one of the dials that you as council can turn as part of your conversations is changes to level of service and then maybe also how far out to the end of the useful life um, of certain types of equipment you think you'd like staff to push it. Is that right, Julie? Right, but those are directly related, correct? Right, yeah, yeah. right, I Julie, mean, you can't, otherwise we just use everything indefinitely if it wouldn't impact service, right? There was a five-year-old girl, she had a... Go ahead, Julie. Is that correct, that those who are related? They, they are definitely re related. It's, um. so if you think about that peanut butter line that 35%. We are not pursuing one third remaining useful life and chucking it out the window. Um, in some instances, we looked at the water storage tanks in my previous slides. The Gregory Hill water storage tanks were run almost to the point of failure. And when it was determined that that whole site needed to be redone. Internally, Public Works was pretty nervous about those water storage tanks. And I will share with you that we are equally concerned in the very same way about the Northridge tanks. So I'm thinking those Northridge tanks are well below that 35% peanut butter line. And so when you think about, and, and this is me talking, representing infrastructure, and this is, this is me talking. Pushing those tanks and turning that dial so low, I think there are very serious trade-offs and I believe that the council in, in 2018 faced those challenges in, in the way that we are, are experiencing. We're on this path right now. I guess that's what I'm saying. So keep those in mind as dials you can turn. Go ahead, Dave. The Gregory Hill, though, that was done before 2018. That was done before I was on council. Correct? The upgrade, you mean? Mm hmm Those those were voted on prior to me being on council. And I got elected in 2017. So I'm just trying to understand. Like I understand the concern for um, you know, things not being pushed too far. Um, but that was not part of our consideration in 2018. I think my reference, thank you, Dave, you are correct. My reference was in concern for tanks that were pushed way below the peanut butter line and, and linking it to something that we are looking ahead to taking care of. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this? All right, move on, Julie, you're doing great. All right, question five, what creates need for new water and wastewater infrastructure? So the prompt here was retirement of old systems or growth. And I'm gonna say the short answer is yes, both retirement of old systems and growth. 
But the longer answer, I'd like to throw in aging condition, which I've talked about quite a bit. But I'd also like to throw in a definition on this capacity to look at growth and non-growth, regulatory, environmental, and contract. So sometimes lack of capacity drives the need for new infrastructure. Growth does require new infrastructure in some cases. New larger sewer interceptors, we have direct experience with those, uh, Little Dry Creek Interceptor Sewer, Big Dry Creek Interceptor Sewer. On the water side, we are extremely conscious of the water supply. And so our conversations about development and growth always include the question, do we have enough water? What is the water budget? What is the limit? We evaluate these development proposals pretty much on a case-by-case -case basis so that we aren't jeopardizing our future selves, so to speak. And then this last investment in raw water reservoirs, these are both growth and non-growth new infrastructure. So these are interesting. And so in my high level understanding of raw water reservoirs, this brings in Colorado water law and water, water rights. I know like this much, but think of it, this is how I think of it. The more water we can push through these raw water reservoirs, the more water we can keep in Stanley Lake as potential potable water. And now I wanna go into this non-growth and hear me out on this. I was thinking about this as I was developing the slide. So non-growth requires new infrastructure in some cases. We have taken to a systematic, a system-wide hydraulic modeling for a system-wide view of water or sewer. This is different from how it has been done in the past. And I think this system-wide hydraulic modeling adds value. When we look at neighborhoods and infrastructure in a neighborhood or in a development, sometimes we're okay. But when we look at a system-wide, this hydraulic modeling reveals that a development over here may have an off-site constraint, either with water or sewer, that needs to be redressed, addressed so that the development is successful, this offsite improvement needs to be made. This is a nuancey thing. And you might say, well, it's growth here that's driving your offsite. And in some cases, this is accurate. But I'm thinking very specifically about the Sheridan water line that we're in design for right now, 80th south towards 75th. Back in the day, this would be in the 70s and 80s, these neighborhoods were developed. And if a utility report was done, we looked at the neighborhood and the development. What we're finding now with a system approach to hydraulic modeling is this larger capacity shared in water line is needed for reliability throughout historic Westminster. So this is a nuancy thing. I just wanted to throw this out. I was thinking about it. But this is a non-growth where new infrastructure is also required. Regulations definitely contribute to the need for new infrastructure. Colorado Department of Health and Environment, they regulate wa uh, wastewater as well as water. This is closely linked to environment. So regulations, try to protect the environment. In our world, changes in raw water quality that affects water quality in Stanley Lake will likely drive new infrastructure needs. Fire in the watershed could compromise Stanley Lake water, for example, flood conditions. And then on the wastewater side, we received a new discharge permit just recently with a much more stringent standard on total inorganic nitrogen. We just went to see council for this, so maybe you'll recall. The limit is very low, and what CDPHE is looking at is downstream user water quality 
we have to treat to take into account the downstream user. It's more stringent, new infrastructure. My last item here is contract. We have regional partnerships with ditch companies that help us supply water, and we have regional partnerships with other, other municipalities. We have shared infrastructure. We have canals and appurtenances. We might have these raw water reservoirs or Stanley Lake, for example. And we have monitoring equipment. All of this contributes to new infrastructure. And with these partnerships come contracts where we must have a thing in place by a certain date that allows other things to happen. So that's a driver for new infrastructure. Questions, discussion, or comments to my response on number five? That was pretty straightforward. Council, you good? They look good. Oh, Lindsay, go ahead. I do have a question um, regarding regulations. Um, how, uh, and I full, I'm fully aware how regulations can drive up costs uh, and cause new infrastructures, um, but how much of that impact would be um, impacted via rates and fees for our Westminster residents? Um, and is there any, are there any new regulations that have caused our, our uh, rate increases partly because of those regulations? Because um, it, it just, I'm trying to piece this all together. Um, and I want to know how much regulations play into this, this yeah. fee or yeah. rate. So much deeper dive on the things that inform costs at the next workshop, but specifically, can you name a regulation or do you know of a re regulation, Julie, that has itself sort of been a big driver, a big push? Specifically right now, the total inorganic nitrogen permit limit that came down right now, could the anoxic mixing project into our current year for design with construction in 21. We had been monitoring this regulation and it entered the permit faster than we thought. So Lindsay, I know about this project, but I don't know if we've tracked regulation, expected cost affecting rates in this year. I would need to think about this more carefully and work with the business operations to see if we can more quantitatively answer your question. Okay, I can I can appreciate that. I'm just concerned though with the answer because part of the criteria for what seemed to be um, the the totality of costs in rate and fees included regulatory, included agent infrastructure, included growth and non-growth. So do you do you see the correlation in my brain as far as where um, how we're not allowing regulatory fluxes to then play into our rate and fees. Because it just seems like we haven't accounted for that. If, <laughs> if that's, that's just, that just seems what I'm hearing is that we haven't, we knew it was coming, but we haven't accounted for it. And that, that, very much seems how how we got to this place with our water and wastewater infrastructure is we knew it was coming we just haven't planned enough for it i'd like to clarify that and i would like to disagree with you we have planned for it but the permit came sooner and the permits for our regional neighbors came in much more stringent sooner, and it's sooner by a year or two. I can show you our raw documents where we contemplate this fixing improvements, the changing in aeration to accomplish this goal that has to do with nitrogen and phosphorus in the receding waters. So term planning allows us to anticipate regulations. We don't have a crystal ball with CDPHE, and I know that's not what you're asking me to do. But 
we do contemplate, sometimes things happen a little bit faster and we have to be nimble. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes. No, refer to the chat. Yep, I already took care of it. Okay. Yep. John was secretly aggressively being muted, but he's cool now. Thanks for calling that out. Go ahead, Julie, next question. Question six. What are the consequences if we delay some of the proposed near-term repairs or upgrades or replacements for infrastructure? Oh, go ahead, Anita. I apologize. I'd like to go back to question five because it's something that we, I'm sorry. I wasn't, I don't know if today is the best day to talk about it or the next time. Okay. But a lot of people who are critical of the 2018 rate increases that were, that took place in 2019 and 2020, um, feel that um, rate payers were have, having to subsidize growth and that the majority of that rate increase was was growth driven. And I don't know if we just want to like parking lot that question for a different day, um, but it does seem relevant with the conversation that we just had in, in regards to infrastructure. My understanding and my memory, which can be faulty, Oh no, she always freezes at the most dramatic time. We need to... <laughs> Excuse me? You froze after you said my memory, which might be faulty, then you froze. Oh no, um, okay. <laughs> so I don't know how much I said after that. So my memory, which might be faulty, um, I remember that the rate increases were based due to age and condition, um, not to fund um, growth. And while some of the, um, replacements did increase capacity and, and would um, assist in growth, that was not the, the primary driver. And so I guess I would like to kind of at some point wrestle that to the ground yep. um, and, and get a clear answer for our residents and for members of our council. Yep, so um, I see you, Dave, just one second. So there's a whole series of slides in the slide deck on costs and rates about how growth fits in um, that you can dig in a little bit more. So. Um, if you want to hold that one for next time, uh, right, this is the sort of the foundational on the infrastructure stuff, and then we can, I assure you, there's a juicy couple of slides on that one in the next slide deck for the, the next meeting. Okay, sounds sounds good. Well, spoiler alert, I'll be asking about that. <laughs> Dave? Dave? Dave, you're muted. You got it? You want me to get it? Got it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to piggyback on what Anita was just saying, I think that there is that misconception about about it being one or the other. And I, I think that even though I voted against it, it was multiple facet from what, what, what we were told. So I hope we cover the whole gamut, because if you go back and you look at the 2018 agendas, which I have, and I'm happy to share if we don't have them readily available, it does say that part of the reason that we were doing it was to conserve. And conservancy goes into a lot of different areas that we've been shared in my time, such as um, in order to meet build out. Um, so, you know, it is a driver, but I think Anita is right that it wasn't the the loan driver. So, uh, you know, I too would like to cover that in, in the full gamut because I think it's fair on both sides of it that uh, often we hear um, both from the critical side or the pro side of what was done in 2018, only one half of that story. And there was a full picture of, of that that conversation. Yep, de definitely part of the conversation. Then I also know you have conservation presentations and water supply presentations coming before you, which are all kind of tied into this big bundle, but we'll definitely talk about the growth and TAP component specifically and how it is related to rates um, at the next meeting. I've seen the slides, they're gorgeous. All right, Julie, carry on. Consequences of delay. The thing will still need to be done. Delay means the thing will cost more in the future. Delay means that if the thing fails, we'll pay a premium to have it repaired or replaced. And we might have to pay for damages to others if that's relevant. Dave? Um, the consequences I just, of delay, on, will there be? Julie, hold on a second. Dave, you on that? I, you yeah, I just want to make a point on that slide. And I understand. And 
um, over the last handful of years is like uh, construction's been hot and you know building's been hot delay can mean more money but that that's not always 100 percent accurate um think think about back when we had huge um cost of oil per barrel and and there were a lot of governments who they they pre-buy oil and so there were instances where people were pre-buying things and then the the market dropped um you know look at the situation that we're in today and i'm not saying that that's not the you know you're kind of rolling the dice one way or another so I think it's fair to look at the other side of that when we discuss about, you know, the cause of delay. Yeah, it could go up, but you know what? It could also go down. That is a potential option. And I just want to throw that out there for people to chew on that. There is an assumption implied in there on past trends, but not 100% sure that that's what the future would hold. Solid. Okay. Anybody else on that one? Okay, carry on, Julie. Will there be catastrophic failure? My short answer is maybe. But what I want to discuss is in the city, we talk about two kinds of failure, routine failure, which is the failure of a mechanical or electrical element. It's likely to happen. We have a backup for that function. And when this thing does happen, it takes maybe a week or less to correct it. Unlikely failure is a simultaneous or multiple mechanical and or electrical failures that require more than a week to correct, results in long-term interruptions to service of water and wastewater, and it's probably costly. Now, we do not design around unlikely failures. We assume a routine failure but we do not assume unlikely failures. Another aspect of question six, will delay kick the can down the road for a future council or generation to sort out? Yes. This is my last slide. What are the best case and worst case scenarios? So from the utility perspective, I, best and worst could have like value connotations, but, but hang with me for a minute. I want to talk about and present a continuum. Continuum of lower rates and fees to higher rates and fees without specifically assigning dollar values. And these are the levers and it could be a level of service. It could be other things that council wants us to consider that we should consider. And they have, you know, up and down factors, kind of like a teeter-totter. On the far left, in the utility perspective, at the lowest possible rate and fee, just scraping by, we think we would see increased failures. This is dramatic. Nobody likes to hear this. I'm usually cautioned not to talk like this. Illness, death, legal action. Oops, sorry. Moving a little bit to the right, concurrent multiple failures. So this is if the unlikely scenario becomes our norm. We would definitely see a decrease in the level of service that we offer to our ratepayers, and the cost of operations and maintenance would increase. I'd say we probably need more staff. They would need more materials, bigger trucks, more trucks to go out and fix all the things. Moving to the right, in this routine failure world, and, and this, is, this is probably where we are now, we generally meet level of service as Public Works thinks about it today. We benefit from industry standard with respect to industry standard useful life. And we use a data-driven method to plan for our infrastructure. Farthest to the right, we have no failures. We fund the unconstrained model. We repair or replace every asset according to the date that it pings. Hey, I need to be fixed. 
need to be replaced. We would definitely need more staff. I think both ends are, are not realistic for where we live and what we talk about, and I fully admit that. But when I think about this question of best case and worst case scenarios, this is how I formulated my response to that question. Okay. And with that. And that's your last total slide in response to council questions on infrastructure? Those are the six questions that you all had asked. Those are my okay. answers. So let's take questions real quick on those slides. And then I just kind of want to hear council what your reflections are on the infrastructure information. Go ahead, Lindsay, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, can you walk me through to better understand um, how, if we are at the lower end of the spectrum, that we'd have illnesses and death as we are supposed to be going by regulatory standards that would help prevent that? Oh, interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you walk back to that slide so we can look at it while you're talking? Sure. Thanks. So when infrastructure fails, and for example, a system at the water treatment plant, what if it failed and we put out water that was not clean, safe, and reliable, and we had a boil water order in the city, something that has never happened in our city? Lindsay, that could cause illness among vulnerable populations. You would be, you would be at that time out of compliance with your, with your permits. So yeah. the point is well taken, but it would still, you're saying, cause potential risk to the people. Yeah. Okay. I'm not understanding how we would get there, though, if we were meeting regulatory standards. If you meet regulatory standards every single day of the year, but you're not funding your infrastructure, and one day that element fails, the next day you could possibly put out unsafe drinking water. Up until the point that that happened, we're good. But from the utility perspective, we aim to stay on top of these items so that we never get ourselves into that position. And those kinds of things take, they take rates and fees to pay for pump replacement in a timely manner, chemical storage in the tanks being safe and sound. Um, and on the wastewater side, manholes that the flow doesn't rise up to within six inches and, and threaten to overtop. All of these things, Lindsay, these are catastrophic accidents. We do our best to never even get close. Dave, did you have a question as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of along the same lines as, as Lindsay. I, I don't, I, I mean, I understand hypothetically what you're saying, but I, I don't even understand why it's part of our discussion today because I don't feel that the city's been in that that uh, position that we've ever underfunded to a point where we're just waiting for the, you know, the lid to blow off, so to speak. I mean, the mayor's been, you know, on multiple councils, and I know that their councils funded stuff. So I just, you know, I, I understand hypothetically, it's important to understand why we take care of the infrastructure. But I think, well, what I got out of Lindsay's point is, is that's not where I've seen us be as a city. And, and I've lived here my entire life. I've never heard that we're having issues where, you know, that's what's around the pen nor talking to people who have been here before this council or this staff that, you know, that they'd been funding stuff. Maybe, you know, maybe the cadence that this group's decided to do is something different. Um, but I, I guess that's what I get out of it. So I'm, I'm a little, I just don't understand the, the extreme examples. So the question, and maybe this is my fault that I heard from some of you was just wanting to understand how bad could bad get. So I phrased the question this way as the worst case. So I think Julie's just answering the question as I had described it. But I think 
Dave, what I hear from you and from Lindsay, like this is also part of the conversation that you can have, right? Is 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 and we talked about this in the presentation um, in my slides last time of some people have different comfort with risk and how how low is too low and how far can you push the line on the repairs and that's part of what you can talk about as council is i don't really think maybe you think that the risk there on that far left side is not doesn't feel like a real um risk for all the reasons that you said and then okay so then maybe you want to play the risk card a little bit farther other people might feel differently so that's and, and i think i think that's fair but i think you know there are residents who are listening and I don't want a misconception of where the city is or where the city has been, unless you have some evidence that we've been in that place that I haven't seen before. I just think it's a it's a valid point. And it, I mean, it's like I, I don't like it seems like we've really spent a lot of time on the extreme of this is what could happen, you know, and people boiling water. And yeah, we have never been there because you know what? Councils before me have taken care of things. And I think that, you know, that's I want people to understand that because I know people are listening to this. Hey, Julie's nodding. Anita, you have a question? Go ahead. Oh, wait, you did. To be clear, this slide doesn't say the spectrum of where Westminster has been. It was what is the worst case scenario if we don't invest in our infrastructure? And we've never been in a time in our history before where we've had so much of our um, infrastructure aging out at the exact same time. So we are in a different scenario. Um, we do benefit from a long line of stewardship of our system. But I think the last, if I remember correctly, what we talked about in the last one of these was how we had such a large percentage because we grew so much during the 70s and 80s aging out at the same time. So it, it's just a different scenario than what we had. So that's that's me wanting to rephrase because I don't I don't feel anyone was trying to impugn former council members or say that we are currently in that increased failure or in or in threat of it um, that that far extreme. Um, I did want to ask though right now what I thought I heard you say is that in routine failures um, is kind of where we're at right now. Is that did I hear you correct with that? Yeah, because when we consider the design of certain infrastructure, we consider that we might have a failure of a thing. And, and that's normal. Sometimes we have multiple things that do the same job. That's why we have backup or reliability of things. Um, and, and I want to be perfectly clear, and Anita and Dave, thank you both for clarifying on this. We do not live on the far left for a variety of reasons, um, including this excellent operations and maintenance staff and these stretched useful life aspects. Uh, city staff, is incredibly diligent, technically creative, and so on it that I like what you said, Anita, this does not represent Westminster specifically. This is a spectrum of how I thought that I would respond to this question. I want to clarify finally, I'm sorry, um, just my last question is we're, we're also not to the extreme right of this because that represents an unconstrained model. And so what we've been doing, as I understood, was following based off of all the, that criticality, vulnerability, all, all of the factors you discussed doing those minimally responsible repairs. Am I understanding that correctly? Mm -hmm. yeah. Herb, you have a question? Not a question, I have a couple of comments. Yeah, go ahead. All right, going back to Lindsay's question about um, the increased failures and violations. There have been times in the past where we have had breaks in our system that required us to notify CDPHE that we've had a break and what we were doing to mitigate those breaks because the potential of contamination because of what was broken, typically lines, 
of contaminated water getting into the pipelines into people's homes did exist. Now we may not have contaminated it to the point that it was gonna require people to boil water and to use bottled water. But those things, we still had the same permit. We were still operating under the same EPA and CDPHE guidelines. But for that period of time during this, we had a violation. Now, because of the actions that we took, we may not have been fined, but we were put on notice and we recorded by state law the fact that we had a break or an incident. That protects us from not reporting. We have certain reporting requirements. So those things do happen. We have been very fortunate in the life of the history of the city, to Julie's point, that we never got to the point of having to put the city or portions of the city into a state of having to boil water because the water in the system between the break and your home got that infected. But you can't always play out the luck card to no extent. So those are things that they still have to deal with. Then to counsel, to Dave's point, Dave, this council is in very fortunate position because I will tell you from my past history, as you pointed out, we have not always taken an aggressive stand of saying, we need to do more long-term sustainability planning as a council, but we listened to what was presented for that typical budget cycle. And the constitution of past councils was, I really don't want to raise people's rate. And then we didn't. We should have, based on where we're at today, because all we did was we kicked it down the road. Now we're at the road where the can can't be kicked any further. So this is great. I want to hear your your takeaways from this information. So one is we don't want to kick the can down the down um, the the road any farther. Others are maybe the can is not quite so far down the road as we thought because of past investments. What other takeaways do you have? Do you have any other like levers that you think that we could identify that you as council could sort of play with when you think about the future? Um, Anita, takeaway thought. What do you got for me? Well, I don't know if this is the right time to address it or not. And I'm really, Heather, please beat me back if if this is not the right time because I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. But um, when I first got on council, I did a lot of tours um, and I was very fortunate. My Cappy, Stu, uh, Pine Glass, a lot of people who are um, really built the reputation of Westminster um, and our water um, department really helped educate me. And when I did do a tour, um, of the North um, West water treatment, I was told that it had originally been designed to be expanded. Um, but because of budget crunches at the time, it was not designed that way. And because of that, um, we it only can handle indoor consumption for Westminster. It's not large enough to handle our full consumption. And so that is why um, now we're, when we're looking at purchasing, if I remember correctly, when we need a new water treatment plant that we can't just shut Semper down and, and do it in situ, but that we actually have to find a new site and build from scratch. Is there, even if that example is wrong and I wanna know if it's wrong, I don't wanna do that to then, I, I want to do things right so we're giving future councils the most amount of options with the least amount of liabilities. Um, but I also don't want to overburden our current residents. And so that story to me has always stuck in my head because it felt like it saved the budget that year, but really has kind of, we inherited that. And so I don't know if that's folklore that I misunderstood and have misremembered and you know, convinced myself is true um, or if that's accurate. Um, but I, I guess I did want to explain that is part of that not wanting to be penny wise and pound foolish that that has kind of stuck with me um, as a counselor. The thing one, and I think that showed up as part of your interest when we talked about the interest for sure. Um, just want to double check, Julie, is that, is that anecdote, is, is Anita's memory on the anecdote reliable? I can confirm the indoor capacity aspect. I would have to go back and ask others if the intent was ever to expand Northwest, but I do know that they were under a, a very tight budget constraint. And I can corroborate the master planning activity for water treatment facilities showed that 
a new facility at a new site was the most advantageous to the city and not trying to construct it center. So I can confirm three out of four, I think. Okay. Catherine, you have a thought? Wait, you're muted. There you go. go. Okay. Um, Anita, that is, I actually remember that too from um, the tour that um, John and I took of the Northwest Center. Now, I, I don't remember that. Um, that it was anticipated to be able to be expanded but what i do remember is that it can't be expanded and um i do remember that it could handle indoor usage for something miraculous like a year it was incredible um and then when we got to semper they talked about how it was failing um and um how the parts were really expensive to replace and um that it just, it wasn't serving our city like it should be and that we needed a new system, um, an additional system. So yes, I, the tours have been out, just an outstanding um, and they really help you understand this, 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 this utility in ways that you never imagined. Um, my takeaways from this are that, you know, when I was running, one of the things that I talked about was that I thought it was so important as a city not to be thinking about today or even just five years down the road, but to be thinking 20 and 50 years down the road, how are we going to sustain our system? And water is our most precious resource. And um, so when I look at this presentation, and Julie, I, I thought this presentation was awesome, but I think I've become a water nerd. So um, <laughs> I just enjoy the details. I, I think I should have, um, I think I missed my calling in life, honestly. I, I should have been um, a water engineer. <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> There's still time, I don't know about that. But I will tell you, my friends at uh, parties think that I'm, I'm quite entertaining when I get on the water subject. So, um, so for me, the water is the most precious resource we have. We have got to protect it. Um, <clears throat> I desperately want to find a way that we can protect our utility, do the right thing for our future generations and our future city, but also manage um, rates that are going to be affordable for our residents. And, and this to me was information. And now I believe that we have a foundation for the conversation and that we can move from here. So um, I appreciate all the questions that have been asked and the comments that have been made. Um, and I, I would like a copy of this presentation just so that I can bring it to parties with me, Julie, and really, really wows them. You got it. <laughs> Everyone be mindful. If you're going to Catherine's party, you might want to bring an extra something to drink. Other reflections uh, from council? Takeaways? Yeah, Rich? I, I, I think especially looking at the chart that's on the screen right now. Um, I, I think there's on everything in life, there's a spectrum and everything in life, there's a trade-off. And so I, th I think there's a pretty good understanding of that. And um, when do we balance costs? When do we spread costs by using bonding so that we can main, uh, maintain uh, generational equity? And then at what point, do we place an excessive burden on certain rate, rate payers and not give equity throughout that use? So um, I'm gonna save most of my comments for the cost of water and then equity discussions too. So, but I appreciate the opportunity. Boy, are you gonna dig the next presentation, man. If, if you feel about rate stuff, the way Catherine feels about this slide deck, you are gonna be a hoot at parties as well. Other reflections, John, any thoughts on this? Takeaways, big huzzahs, or more or less what you thought you knew? What are you thinking? Well, I thought it was a good, uh, good foundation. And yes, I, um, I think I knew a lot of this. That there was a question about reservoirs that was a little bit, I, I guess I might follow up on that later, that, that we don't have capacity, it sounded like. So I'd like to know more about that at some point, but uh, we don't have to touch on that right now, but this was a good presentation. Thank you. Okay. Other folks have big takeaways thinking about what you might want to be carrying from this conversation forward when you start thinking about what ifs and future policy options for the city. Bueller. 
Yep, Lindsay. Are you wanting me to be completely candid? <laughs> yeah. Um, to be quite frank, um, the first two meetings, I feel like I've I've taken a lot of notes, um, and I feel like I've gotten some good information. Um, however, I feel that um, we're not getting to the point, and I know that we're we're doing this in segments and I'm, I'm one not to have a whole lot of patience. So, um, so I'm like, let's get her done right now. Like, let's go. I'm a doer. Um, and so this is, this is really pushing my, uh, structure, but I feel that, um, partly, uh, some of my, the questions that I've asked, um, I don't feel completely comfortable repeating to the public as far as what was answered. Um, because, I just don't feel comfortable with the answer and and quite frankly I don't know what would get me there um, but I think one of the biggest takeaways um, and I think uh, Anita hit it is uh, the retention and really getting this into a condensed solid answer as far as um, what we can tell and show uh, our residents as far as everything that we are going through in these uh, segments um, to really and to really understand where we're at and that's the biggest thing that um, has been my point of contention is that in this is not to question that we need to take care of our infrastructure or the quality of water um, but the management of how we got here that is my biggest sticky point that I don't feel that I have quite <laughs> gotten confidence in in just these two sessions. Mm -hmm. So um, I am still I'm keeping an open mind. I'm still pushing forward and keeping my patience um, through this. Um, so I, I appreciate you allowing us to answer a Q and A at points. So that's helpful. Um, but I look forward to future discussions as far as like. Okay, where are we going? <laughs> right. so. Yeah, and so I'm glad you said that. And I think, and I think a couple of you um, really appreciated this, and a, and a few of you maybe not, you know, are, are getting kind of antsy. And, and so I appreciate your patience. And I, I think the goal, right, is that next when you start talking about rate and other trade-offs, as Rich was saying, and I think um, Anita was sort of leaning on that uh, sort of the trade-off conversation as well, is now now we have better understanding of what the system looks like and where the trade-offs might land in terms of infrastructure. So this was definitely foundational. All this the really juicy stuff that y'all want to talk about on the rates. I mean, I'm telling you, you're going to be so jazzed about the next one. It's got a slide on every one of the things that you want to talk about. So thank you for your perseverance. The juicy conversation on, um, on the rate piece is coming in part because there's more levers there for you to push as well. Or um, I think Chris told me I have to say pull levers, but I'm saying push levers. Um, so. I want to just make sure that, that you heard the same levers for on infrastructure that I heard. So we carry those going forward. You do have some ability to think about levels of service and comfort of risk to those levels of service. That if you wanted to think about how far you push the useful life of stuff, right? The more you push, maybe you increase the risk a little bit. Maybe you want to talk about that. It could impact level of service. It could be a roll of the dice and maybe it'll be fine. And again, different people will come down differently on that line. So there's that sort of piece there. Um, again, the risk of failures and how big you see that risk and how, how um, far you're willing to push that. Part of this piece too is related to the CIP and, and, and how that's funded, which we'll talk about next time. But again, the way that staff thinks about it does relate to some of the assumptions that are embedded in this presentation about how they see the aging of the system, how they understand the need to replace and that informs some of their out year planning and thinking for infrastructure needs, which then informs how they think about the future cost need. So that's how these all these pieces are gonna carry forward. And so for you to know which of the pieces here you can kind of toggle with and how they're gonna pop up in terms of the rate conversation later is super helpful. Um, so levels of service. Um, oh, and, and Dave, you also brought up the, the there's some assumptions about future costs and whether future if we delay things, whether or not they'll actually cost more, that's another thing for you all to consider as part of your future conversation. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. Um, I wanted to share my my takeaways. Yes, please. Um, 
what I'm taking away is, is we're still not getting to the conversation I've wanted to have for three years. It, you know, we can talk about Herb that things got kicked down, the can got kicked. Um, I just, I'd like to see the list of what got kicked. I'd like to see the list of violations that, that occurred. In 2013, I ran for office and I lost. After that election, council, who only one member is on this council now that was there, decreased tap rates. Decreased. So I just don't understand where when we had consistent rate increases, and if you look back over the last 20 years, they had, you know, for the last, you know, prior to the last, say, six years, they were doing 4%, 4%, 4% every year. Prior to that, they were do doing double that every other year. So then they flattened it and then went every other year. And if I talk to former leadership, I'm told that they consistently were evaluating CIP programs and approving CIP programs. You, you know, you always have a budget. You say, this is what my budget is. What are, what are my needs? Here are the most important needs that can fit in this bucket we call a budget, and we move forward with it. I just feel like, you know, that's what I'd really like to get to is, is to understand um, what was missed that caused us to have such a, a drastic change over the last um, six years. Because it, you can look, like I, I actually have a spreadsheet that shows all my bills from when I moved into this house in 2011 and the, the rate increase. And granted, I'm really good with my water. I let my backyard die because I was sick of water in it, to be frank. And, and I can tell you the increase. And it over, say, between 14 and now, the increase is a lot more drastic than the years before. And I understand there was a change in how we looked at it. But I've never really, I, I'd like to understand why. And beyond that, it, you know, my biggest takeaway, and it's not really a takeaway, I, I am very in line with um, Councillor Seymour as far as equability and how we are charging. It's not because um, I don't think it's important. I think water safety is one of our number one priorities. And that, you know, falls into taking care of the infrastructure. But when we start seeing people who let their lawns die and it starts affecting property value and we see people making real hard choices about things like medication versus water, which we can act like that's not happening, but it is happening. You know, yeah. that's where my, my concern lies. That's where my concern lied in 2018. That's where my concern continues to lie. So I'd like, like to get at that at a reasonable level where we're actually, and I hope, like you said, you're right, that in these future conversations, we're actually going to see how we could pull some levers responsibly and try to ease some of this burden off the residents. You 100% are. So many, so many levers in the future conversations, I promise. Go ahead, Anita. So I just want to make clear, it seems like there's two conversations going on. One conversation is trying to understand um, all of the the needs and and tensions with our with our water system, how all of the cost drivers, the condition of our utility, all of this, and another is feeling like somehow a previous council is on trial here, or there's an implication that previous councils, previous managers, previous um, engineers didn't do their job. And I actually heard quite the opposite um, from Ms. Kohler, or rather from Julie, sorry, um, which was that she had a lot of respect and in her heart of hearts did not felt everyone did the best with the information that they had at the time. So what I have heard is that the situation has changed. A, we have more complete information because we hadn't done a, a deep um, system study since 2006, if I'm remembering that correctly like age and condition study. And then two, just we've aged as a community since then. And so I'll talk about it when we're at the rates, but I I remember, I believe it was 2015 or 2016. Um, and this actually goes to your point earlier, uh, Councillor De or Dave, um, which was um, sometimes your variables change huge, like enormously. And that was during the construction boom. And so, previous council, which had done a good job wanting to have the steady rate increases so they weren't so shocking, the index that they had connected it to no longer was matching the costs of how much more expensive things were, the construction costs, right? And so that's why we had to kind of change it. So some of those 
drivers age and condition and also construction costs had just changed i don't think i'm not going to say past councils are bad but knowing what i know now what are we going to do going forward and i'd really like to focus on knowing what we know now how are we going to go forward um i don't feel there's a lot of benefit in blaming a previous body or in in protecting them let's let's focus on on what is our responsibility in my opinion that's how i'd like to go forward and i i would encourage you to think about it sort of two pieces one is, is what you've said anita but also where there are things that you know if we had a do-over we would have done it differently knowing what we know now and we can learn those lessons we should also carry those forward and that's a little bit what i hear in some of the other questions as well so what are the lessons that we can learn carry those forward but in the end all the questions I'm going to ask you about what, what do you want to do next on rates for the equity piece to balance all these components that's all just forward looking because whatever happened has happened we should learn from it whatever it might be and then figure out what y'all think are the choices for the future um so I'm really jazzed I, again I'm kind of a nerd for different reasons but I'm really jazzed for you to have the conversation that's going to start with the next slide deck and I think um it's going to get at these pieces um, Dave, uh, there's, there's a there's some information about the the trend in rates, and we can start. We and you can see the years and say what happened right there, what happened in whatever the year that was, and so we can start to piece tease out some of those questions that you're asking in part of that information. It relates to this, but it's different, and so that's why it's in that slide deck and not this one. I understand. I just want to make one quick point. Yeah. And point being is, it's not about blame. It's about what's been done in the past, and it's about in 2006 the leadership then didn't think oh in 15 years this is not going to be x amount of years old it you know that that was part of their evaluation it's always been part of the evaluation okay fair enough anyone have any last thoughts because if not i'm super excited for you to talk about meters next Catherine's like yay more nerd stuff cool all right um, so this was, I'm um, just go back to that slide real quick, Julie. Um, so we're tracking levers. I picked up a couple more in your conversation today, assumptions and levers that we'll just have as, as an ongoing conversation so that when we get back to it in December, we're really like, what do you want to do? We have a comprehensive list of sort of policy buttons that y'all can push and dials you can turn. So you'll start to see this kind of slide get populated as we go along and more of them cute little stars. Um, cause those are some of the things that you can fiddle with as you think about the future. Julie, you've been a joy. You're off the hook, friend. Hey, Stephen, you're in the you're in the presentation seat, sir. Let's see your shining face, darling. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fantastic. Would you tell us ever so briefly who you are and why we why we're taking your thoughts on this, and then tell us about meters, if you would. Yeah. Um, my name is Stephen Gay. I'm the utilities operations manager uh, for the city of Westminster. I work in the public works and utilities department. Uh, I'd like to thank you, you know, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members for giving me this opportunity to have a conversation with you tonight regarding our meters and our metering systems. Uh, to tee up the discussion, I'm going to start with a, a high level review of where we were, where we are now, and where we're going with regards to our meters and the associated meter reading system. Along the way, I hope to answer some questions regarding why we're changing the meter system out, um, how we identify the replacement system, where we are with regards to the system replacement, and why are we confident in the accuracy of the meters that we're installing today? So, and that's just to name a few. So if you guys are ready to get started, I am. So, Julie, if you could take us to the first slide. In 2006-2007, uh, we replaced our small meter system. But in 2016, that system reached the end of its useful life. In 2016 to 2018, we conducted pilot testing to identify viable replacement technologies. In 2018 to 2019, we competitively bid this project. In June of 2019, Council approved our recommended solution to replace the small meters. And in January of 2020, we started putting, actually putting new meters into the ground. Now there was some work that was done between June of 2019 and January of 2020. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on in the slide presentation. 
Uh, we expect by February of 2021 to be complete with the meter replacement uh, project. And then looking forward in July of 2021, we're hoping to launch a customer portal. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And then after that phase, the customer portal is launched, we hope to be able to evaluate uh, our billing cycle and potentially make some adjustments to that. So Julie, uh, next slide, please. Ah, there we go. So why change the meters? Well, the short answer is the system had exceeded its useful life and was failing. It's these failures that triggered our evaluation of a replacement metering system in 2016. And it's important to note that when we talk about meters, we're actually talking about, you know, the meters are part of a larger system. So um, when we talk about replacing the meters, we're actually talking about replacing the metering system. Uh, most meters systems consist of, you know, a meter, batteries, radios, or some type of a communications device and related software. And referencing our existing meter system, uh, the meters themselves were the most mechanical component within that system. And as these systems age, as you know, and I heard the conversation, I you, you understand parts start stop moving uh, or malfunction, batteries die, radios fail. This is what triggered our evaluation in 2016, a significant number of failures throughout the entire system. And the software was no longer even supported by the manufacturer. So essentially, it was becoming more and more expensive for us to keep fixing the system. And it was time to replace it. Next slide, please. Awkward pause. I have the new slide. Do you have it? Uh, uh, oh, all right, there we go. All right, so now that we've decided to, that the existing system needed to be replaced, you know, what do we replace it with, right? So the utilities operations team, specifically our meter shop, conducted pilot testing of, to evaluate meter systems. Now the team identified five manufacturers based off of their industry experience and market availability. And from 2016 to 2018, this team pilot tested all five of these systems installing meters on residential and commercial services. All pilot meters were tested for accuracy prior to installation in the field. The meters were installed again in residential and, and commercial services. And the distribution of the pilot meters varied based off of topography uh, and communication considerations. We really wanted to evaluate the meter system's performance in some of our more challenging areas. We also wanted to evaluate the quality of materials and the ease of installation. So we spread the installations out throughout the entire distribution system. You know, as you can imagine, some of our, our older parts of town were more mature and came with some unique challenges with regards to installations. And the newer parts of the system, well, they were, you know, they were more modern and they had less, of cha less challenges associated with those, those installations. Um, this gave the team a sense of how durable the, the components or the, the meters and materials were and how difficult some installations might be. Uh, we tested the meters, these meter systems in the field for six to eight months um, to evaluate their performance. The data that was acquired from the pilot testing informed the system specifications that was folded into our request for proposal. Now, this data clarified for the meter team the must-haves for the new system. It must be accurate. It must be reliable, well constructed, have a reasonable have reasonable operation and maintenance costs associated with it, and provide our end users with tools that they could use to monitor and manage their own water use. So the project was competitively bid in February of 2019. Five meter the five meter companies that participated in the pilot were invited to bid on the project. Two of them responded, and one of them was disqualified for failure to meet our specifications of the RFP. However, since this was an RFP, it, the team did evaluate their proposal fully, 
and this evaluation identified that the proposal included an additional operations and maintenance cost and ongoing cost for the communications component of the metering system. In essence, it would lock us into a 20-year agreement for cellular data equal to $350,000 a year for the first year with incremental increases built in for subsequent years. So the selected, the selected meter so, uh, solution did not have the same ongoing O&M costs. And this is an example of one of the variables when we did the evaluation. Now, as a result of the bidding process, our evaluation, or, or in our evaluation, UMS, that's utility metering so, uh, so services, was selected to install the census metering system. Next slide, please. So what is the status of the metering replacement, the meter replacement project? Remember on that first slide, I said that there was some work done um, between council approval and actually putting the meters in the ground in January of 2020. We actually uh, stood up a fixed network to communicate with the meters that are, are, are being installed today. And we tested that, that network to ensure its reliability and connectivity throughout our, our system. And then we began installing the meters in January of 2020. As of October, so that's yesterday, uh, we have replaced 27,568 meters. We expect to complete the meter installation project by February of 2020, and that's gonna be 31,500 meters. However, given our current pace, it's likely that we'll be completed with the project before the end of 2020. Again, the focus is on small meters, predominantly residential. And these meters were installed, and, and so our strategy for installing the meters was based off of billing cycle. So we wanted to wait until a cycle had finished billing, and then the team would come in afterward to install the new meters. And, and this was done to you know, minimize the disruption and con confusion for our customers. And again, as you can see, the customer portal coming in 2021. So uh, next slide, please. So what should you know about the meters? Well, there's a lot of features in the new metering system, but one of the, one of the most valuable we're seeing is that it stores hourly read data where our old metering system didn't. So essentially with the old metering system, what we would do is we'd have a metering technician drive a route. So they drive down the street and the equipment in their vehicle would send out a signal to the meters in the area and say, hey, wake up, tell me what your meter reading is right now at this time. And we would take the old meter reading and the new meter reading and the difference between the two of them was the consumption. Well, the new readers meter reading system actually captures and stores hourly consumption data. And now this is important as it allows the customer, ability, the customer the ability to identify when consumption actually occurred and how much water was used during that period of time. So for example, my teenager, which I don't have any teenagers anymore, they're all grown and gone and you know, around the world actually right now. Um, but say they take a shower every evening after dinner for 45 minutes. Well, that shower just used X amount of gallons of water. The customer, or customers are able, will be able to see that data dynamically. And then they can use that to help them optimize their water use if they choose to. So they can say, hey, you don't want to cut your shower down from 45 minutes to 30 minutes. You only need that much time to get clean, right? Um, the news meter system also allows for the review of past consumption, right? So it helps the customer identify when, cons you know, their consumption, pat um, their consumption patterns. Here again, they can use this information to make decisions regarding the way they choose to use water. For example, my sprinkler systems run three times a day for 50 minutes, seven days a week. Each time I run that system, I use 450 gallons of water. Based off of this information, the customer may choose to reduce the frequency or the duration of irrigation in an effort to optimize the water use. It's a tool for them. The new meter system will provide leak alerts within 24 hours once our portal is active. Currently, we notify customers 
between 30 and 90 days after we, a leak is detected on the current. Um, and that's 30 to 90 days after a leak is detected. And that's based off of the current system, the way the current, the way the current system operates and the utility billing workload. The meters are more sensitive technology that identifies small leaks. Um, this metering system has a, an expected useful life of 20 years versus the 10 years of the system that we're replacing. It allows for firmware updates to be pushed out remotely. So through that fixed network that I talked about, we can literally push out those, those updates to the meters and, um, and the software remotely, where in the past, historically, we would have to drive the routes. So we'd have to put an individual in a vehicle and you'd have to drive through the neighborhoods, updating all the meters along the way. Um, and it also allows for remote reading. So the way, as I, as I said, the way that we read the meters now, somebody gets in a vehicle and they drive a route and, they, and that's how they read the meters. Uh, we no longer have to do that with the new metering system. So currently it takes us 80 personnel hours every month to read our meter routes, right? With the new system, because it is a remote read, it's literally a click of a button and we can download those reads within that route. Um, in addition, when we when we activate or discontinue a service, we have to we have to send a technician out to that site to capture the either final read or the startup read and report that over to utility billing. Yes, sir, Mr. Demont, Councilor Demont. With the uh, with with the ability to do that so much easier, because I've mm -hmm. heard in the past when we talk about the different. Um, billing cycles that I thought that that was a driver uh, about the billing cycles because of the complexity of going out and driving and picking up meter reads. Does that, do these new meters allow us to uh, regu regularize the, I don't know if that's the right word or even a word at all, make a, a more standard billing cycle so that everybody has say a 30 day billing cycle or, or whatever? That's our hope. Um, when, we're, when we're done deploying the meter system and the customer portal that is, Ex absolutely what we'll be evaluating if we're, we're able to normalize that, that frequency. All right, great, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Um, so there's no driving to get those, those final reads or those, those new reads, and it's huge savings in time. Uh, so the next, next slide, please. So what's, what's the long-term plan, right? Well, you heard me talk about the portal. Well, this portal is focused on providing our customers with tools they can use to optimize their water use. It provides them a tool that they can, they can customize leak and high use notifications. They can, look on demand, they can access their hourly use data and say, hey, you know what, my sprinklers ran last night. I wanna see for each zone that came on, I can look to see what's going on with that, that actual consumption. Uh, they'll have access to historical bill and uh, bill use and comparison. And one of the, the most exciting features that I, I feel that it provides, the portal will provide, is the ability for the end user to, to set their own water budget, if, you know, for lack of a better term. They could look into their, you know, they could look at their situation and say, hey, you know what, I, I only want to spend $50 a month on my water bill, whatever the number is. The system is intelligent enough and through the portal will be able to track their consumption throughout the month and send them notifications. Hey, you're at the, you're at, you know, half of your, the 15th of the month, you're doing great. You're only at 25% uh, consumption of 25% of your, the budget that you set for yourself. So I think this is a, this is a huge um, tool or could be a huge tool for the customers that, that may want to leverage it. And again, back to your, your, your comment, Councillor DeMott, is it will, we do believe it will provide us the ability to support a change in the billing cycle length. Next slide, please. All right, here's a question. Yes. Are we aware of legal troubles with census? Yes, we are. We are aware that census had issues regarding accuracy prior to 2017. We are also aware that census identified the issue and resolved it. It was related to a manufacturing process and the use of a new material in the flow tube of the meters. 
Uh, we are also well uh, see, yeah, and since this did, they reverted back to the original process and the material for this, this component of the meters. And since then, well, they've resolved the issue. We have no data or we're not aware of any um, product issues since they've made that correction. And I think it's also important to, to point out, and I'll, and I'll touch on this on the next slide as well, but it's important to understand that all the meters that we're installing in our system today are tested to a American Water Works Association standard for accuracy. And that standard was published in 2018. So everything that we're installing in the system today is tested for accuracy to that 2018 standard. So speaking of accuracy, next slide, please. So how do we know the meters are accurate? Well, we essentially have five data points that give us, give us a high level of confidence that the meters are accurate. The first of which I mentioned in the last slide, and that is that we know that census modified their, manu their processes to correct the previous accuracy issues, and that the meters we are installing are part, as part of this project are tested to a 2018 AWWA accuracy standard. That's AWWA is the American Water Works Association. Um, additionally, the manufacturer self-certifies that they are compliant with the national standards for health and safety. They also self-certify that, the, that they are compliant with the American Water Works Stand, Association standard for accuracy and that their meters are tested using an American Water Works Association standard for testing. They self-certify all of this information, but beyond that, the manufacturer sends batch samples of the meters to a third-party independent laboratory. This laboratory um, verifies the, these, the, the compliance with these standards. So they test them using the same AWWA testing methodology. They compare the results to the same AWWA standard for accuracy. And then they certify that accuracy and they provide that credential to us as the end user. In addition to that, we, the city of Westminster, actually conduct the same accuracy testing. We do batch samples of all the new meters that are provided to us as part of this project. So we put the meters on the bench. We use the same AWWA testing methodology. We compare those results to the same AWWA standard for accuracy. And in our testing of the, our bench testing, we, we, we have realized 100% accuracy or compliance with the AWWA standards. And lastly, when a customer has a concern with regards to the potential accuracy of their meter, we send the metering technician out there. We offer to bring the meter into the shop. We offer for the customer to accompany us and observe the test on our bench. And we follow, again, the AWWA standard for testing methodology and compare those results to the AWWA standards. Um, and just so you know, the, all three, both the manufacturer, the independent testing lab, and the city of Westminster all use a, a gravimetric automated water meter test bench. Our bench is state certified and calibrated annually by an independent contractor. So these factors are what give us that high level of confidence that the meters that we have purchased and are installing are accurate. They meet the AWWA standard. So next slide, please. So what are my meters accurate? And I still have concerns. Well, we have a plan for that. Um, we've had customers express concerns about their new meters. When we receive these concerns, we investigate. Um, and uh, admittedly, during a handful of these investigations, and I would say five or less, we have found that the new meter was improperly installed, resulting in a leak on the customer's side. Well, in these cases, we work with our utility billing to ensure the account is properly credited. So there's no impact to the customer. But when 
proper insulation isn't the cause of the customer's concern, what do we do, right? Well, with especially with this new meter technology, we can walk through the customer's hourly consumption or consumption history to help them identify the cause of any increased use. Um, the hourly consumption profile helps us identify uh, the cause and most common findings are leaky toilets, uh, sprinkler system settings, uh, and indoor leaks. And believe it or not, the data will actually, when you look at the profile, you can really tell when you drill down uh, whether it is a toilet leak or a slow leak or a sprinkler system. Now, depending on what this analysis reveals, we then we then uh, direct or, or, or you know, lead our customers to some resources that we have available. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the sprinkler audit that uh, Public Works and Utilities purchases a number of these audits every year and make them available at no cost to the customers. And they have an independent contractor that comes out to the customer's home. They set up these little cups all through the, the lawn and they run, they look at the sprinkler system and the timing and the amount of times that the, that the system's running. Then they run it to make sure that they're getting an adequate coverage for their, their specific need and uh, make adjustments. And, and that is a service that we provide to the customer at no, no cost. And I believe that there's a new program. I don't know much about it. Uh, it is the indoor leak investigation program that we are moving forward with. And, it's, and I, I know Chris is maybe a panelist on this and she might, or Max may chime in on it, but I believe it's a similar structure. We'll be purchasing a number of these audits or these um, investigations in advance and making those available to customers at no additional cost uh, in the future. So next slide, please. So I'm an operations guy. I, I, I run and maintain our distribution and collection and treatment systems. So this is about how the, the water is built. I'm going to do my very best to walk you through this. But if I mess up, I, I know somebody. <laughs> um, so let's have the, the, the first one here. So it, in a given month, the first month, say the customer uses 6,251 gallons of water. Now, it's important to remember, we only bill per thousand gallons used. That's all we do. We bill per thousand gallons that are used. So in this case, what are we going to bill the customer? We're going to bill the customer for, okay, next button for 6,000 gallons of use. So what do we do with that 250 gallons? We take that 250 gallons and we carry it forward to the next billing cycle. So say in that case, the customer uses 6,722 gallons of water. We add the 251 gallons to that, coming up with a grand total of 6,978 gallons. Any guess on what we're going to charge the customer, what we're going to bill them for? 6,000 gallons. So we take the 978 gallons that's left over and we carry that forward to the next billing cycle. So say in this cycle, the customer uses 5,050 gallons of water. We add the 978 gallons to the 550, 5,050 gallons to come up with a total of 6,028 gallons of water and we bill the customer for 6,000 gallons. So that's how the water use is metered and billed. And with that, I believe I've ended the my presentation and will make myself available to answer any questions you may have at this time. Real quickly, um, Stephen, uh, two things. One is on that last slide, the reason that we care about that is one of the questions you're hearing about the meters is how can the meter be accurate if I'm always getting billed for the same amount of water? And that's why we laid that out, right? Because to explain why there's a there's a reason there, okay? Yeah. Second thing is you're participating in informal council discussion night, and so we're calling people by their first names. So get on board. All hey, right. The old habits die hard, and they don't let me out very often, and this is why. I'm this just is saying. why? Okay, well, let's try harder. All yeah. right, council. Um, this was a uh, information that you all requested based on some Hello. feedback that you're getting from your um, for your from your uh, constituents. What questions or comments do you have, Herb? Yeah, this is more a comment, and this is going back to a piece where Stephen was talking about the difference between the previous meter and these meters is they're mechanically manufactured out of basically the same materials. Mm -hmm. 
we had an inquiry that indicated that because the meter was changed out to the new meter, that the customer received a grounding problem at their home. Hmm. The meter is not the grounding issue. Between the meter pit and a person's home, there's a pipe that's buried in the ground, directly exposed to the earth, hmm. out of copper. That is a grounding method under the state electrical law. Mm -hmm. Having had a master electrician's license, I know where I can go to for a ground. Mm -hmm. Now, if a ground for the copper line is not near to the electrical service, then the electrician is required to drag an eight foot ground rod in next to the electrical service and attach to that for the grounding service for the home. So the meters have nothing to do with the house electrical system being grounded. That is also true that if you have an overhead electrical service, whether it's underground in your home or overhead, the grounding requirements for the electrician are the same. Excellent, thank you. Anita, question, comment? I have a question. Um, Kind of similar to Counselor DeMont, I've heard stories of people the very first month that they have the meters, that they have a real spiky um, bill where it jumps up and then after that it seems pretty normal. Um, and recently I forwarded on um, a question like this from a woman who um, I have known for years and years, like she's taught my child Sunday school. Um, I know her to be very calm, level-headed. Um, and when we forwarded on her bill, um, and it was in the month that her meter was installed, um, they were they were able to tell because of these new meters that the the extreme usage didn't happen after the new meter, but happened sometime prior. <clears throat> so this is a this is a question I don't expect you to have an answer, but I'd like us to look into. Is there anything that could occur in the installation process that could make the previous meters read a much higher usage than is actual? Um, just because I've heard it a few times, um, our own city utility department looked at our bill and was like, yeah, that was really unusual use for you. And, and actually, once you got the new meter, your water use went down. It just, it just, okay. It just feels funny and I feel like I've heard it enough times that I just, I'd like to figure out if there's, if it's just that sort where it was, maybe she left her garden hose on, you know, the night before the new meter came on. Um, I just would like to understand how that could happen. And and maybe, the, maybe it is an answer just like that, that there's no possible way in process it could go up. But I guess I just want to let you know that there is that curiosity in the community and kind of prevalent concern that there's something going on with the installation process. Well, if if I, if you're right, I don't, I, I couldn't provide you an answer this evening, but I can look into it. And I just want to make sure I got your, your question right, uh, Anita. I can offline share with you um, her name, but I know there's been other people like that who have emailed in their bills. Okay, if you could provide that, we'll definitely look into it and see if we can we can get you an answer. I'll yeah. email you just now. Okay, thank you. Dave, you're, the folks that you've heard from, similar thing where, where it was a like spike in the month that it was installed or you're, you have a different set of um, sort of experiences well, from I, the folks you've talked I think, to? I think all of us have heard that, but um, I actually um, have another question spurred yeah. off of Anita's question. And, and this is just more of a curiosity, so maybe as you, work on her question and getting us some information on that. I'm just curious, you know, with all the testing and everything, obviously any kind of meter has a certain um, pressure limitation. So mm -hmm. and the, as Anita was talking about um, the question that she just had for you, I was thinking about, um, and this is a different kind of meter, but I re remember hearing the whole story of the, the house that blew up in the city because of, um, Basically, it's if I remember right, there was something faulty with cool. the meter or the gas into a home that you know caused the pressure caused it to fail. So along that lines, and I don't know if this is true or not. I'm just curious as we as we're you know adding all these meters throughout the city, is there fluctuation in pressure in our system, um, or just in general fluctuation in pressure in the system? How do these meters? I mean, I'm sure all these meters have some way of they 
they compensate for that? Is there like a you know pretty wide range that they can tolerate? Um, mm -hmm. Is as far as how they operate and this is just more of a curiosity off of you know kind of what anita's saying and thinking through obviously you've been attaching these new meters this has been going on you know throughout mm -hmm. the city i remember when they did mine it was in in the midst of of you know everything really being bad in the beginning of april and but that man they just went down the street i'd see them you know one after another just kind of going through them so how can you do you have any yeah. information on that or is that something you could follow up with us i i I can I can give you a brief answer. So, sure. so fundamentally, the pressures are maintained within the distribution through pressure regulating valves, and those are control valves that uh, monitor the upstream pressure and then kind of reduce it or increase it for downstream pressure. The example that you're giving about the the home that had um, concerns with uh, the water pressure was due to a failure failed pressure regulating valve in the system which what happens is when they when they fail, they actually open up all the way. So all the pressure had moved from the upstream side to the downstream side, causing some issues with on the customer's service. Um, it had nothing to do with the water meter. It was actually a, a control valve that's that are strategically placed throughout the distribution system. The other example you, you mentioned was, uh, I believe it was due to a faulty gas meter, and that mm -hmm. was the whole blew up I believe over by uh, City Hall some years ago um, and that was I believe that was the cause of that so with regards to the water meter structure uh, construction you're absolutely right they have a very wide range of operation but they don't they're not really the the pressure has little to no effect on them and has little to no in, impact on the downstream user but that's, that's good to know that totally answers my question because I just you know, I don't know enough about them to know if, you know, if we had fluctuations in pressure, if it would really affect them. So I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Other okay. council questions for Stephen? Yeah, Rich. Uh, just a takeaway from this part two, um, and this, let's let you know my ignorance on this. I, I didn't realize that we rolled over the balance to, uh, round numbers because that that gives me some concern um, why we don't use an incremental billing system when we have a tier system it, it could it could possibly bump people at the wrong time to the next tier because of because of a carryover um, and if if we're now sophisticated enough to get those exact readings can we use incremental billing and charge people for what they use every month mm -hmm. So part of that is, a, I assume, a conversation we can have as part of the policy discussion, how that relates to rates. I guess I'm just double checking with you, Stephen, that because we can, because the, the, the meters do um, measure at that finer scale, the mm -hmm. meter reading detail is not a barrier to incremental billing. It's different yeah. stuff that we can talk about. Is that right? Yeah, that would absolutely be a policy decision on how you wanted to bill consumption, whether it be per gallon or per thousand gallons. We have historically, which means nothing because we can we can always change, um, have built per thousand gallons of use. So Rich, you have identified another lever that we'll put on our lever sheet of things for you all to consider when you wanna talk about ways to change if you wanna change going forward for sure. Um, other questions, comments, takeaways? I, I did ask staff to go through all the public uh, comments through the website and just pull out all the meter questions to make sure we, we tackled all of the ones that were there. So, and I think this addressed those. Have any of you heard any other questions that somehow um, weren't addressed in uh, about meters that weren't addressed here? Yep, Dave, and then Lindsay. I'm just curious on the, on the, the leak program. Is that available? And and I think we talked about this, so I just want to clarify my remembering. Is that available to any resident, or is it a fa only available to like um, a certain income qualified resident? Is there, you know, what is who is that program available to? Uh, don't don't quote me on this. I, I will verify um, my answer, but I do believe it's it's very similar to our um, irrigation program in that it's available to. Any, any resident that requests. It's not based off of, of revenue or income or you know, financial situation. It's you're a resident, you have a concern, 
you'd like an investigation, we prepay for a number of these every year. And I can verify that and get back to you, Councillor David. Thank you, I Chris, appreciate it. Chris Gray texted me and said, yes, it's available to all residents. There you go. Yeah, multitasking here from all the staff. Lindsay, quick right. question. Yes, um, and I don't know if this it falls into the meter question. Um, and I don't, um, and forgive me if, if you touched on it, um, is the cycle of which we, um, we charge residents. Um, Cause I know that some people have had concerns about a 33 day cycle. Um, and some of the answer involved the meters and how we read them. Uh, so I didn't know if that was appropriate to ask here versus into another discussion. So, Stephen, you correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is the technical barrier that was driving the meter, the, the billing cycle previously goes away with these new meters. So part of the council conversation can on policy can be um, to forward looking, regularize, see, Dave, totally a word, regularize the uh, billing cycle. Um, but we do, it sounds like we need to wait until that, that, that uh, customer portal thing is is yeah. up and ready to go. Is that right, Stephen? I think I think that the prudent approach would be to wait until the system is fully integrated and the customer portal is launched. And then we can collect some data and we can we can we can evaluate our ability to uh, modify that cycle. We believe we we strongly believe that that will be. Um, possible, but I don't want to commit to anything at this point until we get everything kind of installed and the customer portal going and and we verify that with our billing staff and things as well. Is that is that a fair answer, Councilor Lindsay? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's getting better. He got you to Councilor Lindsay, so we're making progress. <laughs> um, and just to Councilor Lindsay's question though, um, Stephen, that uh, the portal you expect to be ready sort of May, June-ish, and that's about the time that Council can start to think about that is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So in the near term, but not right this very minute. Correct. Okay. Um, so council, I'm mindful that it's eight o'clock. I wanted to talk to you for a quick minute about community engagement. Um, can you hang with us mm -hmm. for a little longer? Am I good? Yeah, you're good. Thank have you. <laughs> thank you. you everyone. Have a back. wonderful evening. And thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Cool. Council, can you give us a few more minutes to talk about community engagement? I see nodding. Thank you. More nodding. Nodding is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the, the, the visual. Um, so next uh, question or slide, if you would, Julie, just a quick thing. Um, we've been tracking uh, related to community engagement. If you remember on our last workshop, we said if if residents have questions and we can get any of those questions addressed through these, we'd be delighted to do that. Um, and so some of those have come through the website and I just want to do full disclosure of what we heard and whether or not we think we're answering them. So one, um, we saw one about, will there be a rate increase in 2022 to reflect our rate change, maybe in 2022 to reflect uh, the revenues from 2021? Um, and that's any rate changes, right? That's part of your policy conversation that you can start um, in December and figure out what you want to do going forward. So that's a TBD, but we're tracking it for you to consider. Um, we got the question about are the new meters causing spikes in usage? I think to the best of our ability, um, folks have answered that one tonight. Um, heard what was the uh, 2019 actual revenue versus the uh, 2019 budget projection and what's the projection for 2020? That's part of that juicy cost, how we calculate costs, things that will be in your next um, uh, conversation on the 5th. Uh, someone suggested that maybe staff should provide annual actual revenues and compare them to their budget projections on a regular basis for council to consider um, if you wanted to change rates in response to actual versus projected. Um, and staff provides this information as part of your annual budget conversations and then you get those monthly financial updates. So this one, um, as, a, as, a, as a reporting from staff to you, seems to be already in the system. Again, whether or not you wanted to roll that into policy changes on rates that's for you to consider in december um does council want to uh, consider changing rates in response to the revenues that were received above the budgets again that's part of that your call to have that conversation in december um our rate payers charge for repairs when contractors damage their pipes um and no um 
all the ratepayers don't pay if my contractor damages my pipes, but rather um, the either the homeowner or the contractor is required to pay for those. And then, and Rich, this sort of gets to something that you've that you've alluded to on equity. Um, why are current customers bearing the brunt of paying for all these current and future infrastructure projects? And so that is part of that rate consideration and how staff thinks about uh, infrastructure and maintenance going forward. Um, so you'll have information about it on the 5th and then what you all as council want to um, suggest that staff do about it or um, get some community feedback on some ideas that would be part of your conversation in December and January. Um, so we're, we're keeping an eye on these. If you're getting things, continue to send them to us. Community members who are watching, of which there are, it looks like a good bunch, um, would really uh, encourage you to keep sending these questions in through the website um, or through your members of council because that's super helpful for us to know what's on everybody's mind. Yeah, Anita. This is Anita. I just I think that one question: Are ratepayers charged for repairs when contractors damage pipes? I think you talked about it like at the residential level, but my guess is they're probably meaning about like Bigger large picture. developments. Yeah. And so I think the answer still holds true, whether it's Comcast or a massive developer, they're accountable for fixing the system. Correct. That's my understanding. Julie will pipe in and tell us if we're wrong. Okay, so. Um, next slide, Julie. Okay, so when last we were together, we asked you, you know, here are some options for ways to think about community engagement. Um, you gave us some feedback and I said we would think about it some more and um, come back to you with some, some more refined thoughts. Next slide. So we went through and looked at um, the overall schedule. I heard what you all said and I just wanted to start with some general principles of community, community engagement that we think about. The first one is we ask for input on things that on, on things that matter to people. Uh, we ask for input in ways that can influence the outcome. Anita, this is part of what you were saying last time of if we don't, if it's not going to influence, then we're not going to ask them. The third one is uh, we ask for input in ways and places that are accessible and convenient to people um, so that it's not hard for them to engage. We try to minimize the barriers to engagement. And the fourth one is um, we ask for input at a time when it can be used to influence the out the outcome. Um, so timing does matter. Um, for me personally, my number one rule, and I give this advice to all the people, is just fundamentally don't ask if you don't care. If we're going to ask the question, it means we care about your answers and your answers are going to um, be used to consider a policy option. You're not guaranteeing that you're going to make the change that people want, but you have to ask questions where you're, where you're open to incorporating that feedback into the things. So, for example, I'm going to give you some ideas about what we want to talk to the community about, and one of them is not whether or not people want safe water because we're going to give them safe water, right? We talked about the regulations, that's just a thing. So that's the kind of question we wouldn't ask because even if someone says, you know what, I'm okay if you kind of lower the quality of my water because that would make my water cheaper, that's not the question that we're gonna ask. We ask questions that can actually influence things um, because the, yeah, we ask questions when we care. Next slide. So based on those thoughts, what we've thought about is um, and, and Lindsay, we had a sort of an email exchange about this. There's kind of two rounds of a community engagement in what we've talked about. The first round starts sort of now-ish um, and now through sort of December, right? And this is when we talked about doing that front-loaded, front-end engagement on um, community values and preferences, where we can ask them about infrastructure costs and rates and trade-offs and other kinds of things that have been part of your conversation tonight, those equity questions, the how would you balance the trade-offs kind of stuff. We ask them that now to inform your council conversation um, later on about you know, what kind of ideas do you have for ways to balance those. So we get input from them to inform your discussion. Then sort of January, December, January-ish, you all come up with some cool ideas. This might be one idea, it might be three ideas, it might be two, it might be four, I don't really know. But you'll have ideas of ways that we could differently, different ways that we could balance the trade-offs. And then we would wanna go back to the community and say, here are some ideas what do you think about these ideas? So it's that, it, it's the two rounds, um, and that second round is about getting community input on one or more options from your conversations, and then you would use whatever their feedback is to sort of refine that down to one option for the, for the future. So two rounds, roughly December, November, December, concurrent to your conversations here, we would be going out to the community to get their feedback on these higher level things. And then when you're ready to talk about ideas, you would have that information to inform your ideas. Next slide. Um, so I was trying to brainstorm, and I thought a lot about your conversation last time about what are the kinds of questions that, that we can ask the community. 
some of them are similar to the levers that you are you all can pull as part of your policy conversation. We can ask them what are their level of service expectations. We can ask them questions about their level of concern about long-term needs and future infrastructure and how they think about that. Um, we can ask them about how they what they think is the right allocation of current of resources to current and future infrastructures, how they would balance kind of that equity piece. Um, we could ask them, you know, if you're concerned about the future, but rate high rates or current rate structure is not for you, what other ideas or options, you know, do we want to kick around? Maybe community people are real smart. Maybe they have some sweet ideas. Um, we could ask them something about their level of concern about their rates and their current bills. Maybe there, I suspect there's a range of opinions in your community. It's a nice um, broad diversity of humanity, um, but mostly why, why does that concern them? Do you have those people, a lot of those people who are not, um, you know, making hard trade-offs in their personal expenditures, et cetera. Um, we could ask them about their preferences and options for having people who use more water pay more or not pay more. So if that conservation pricing, that's part of that tier structure, we could ask people if they think that's a good idea or a terrible idea or somewhere in between. Um, we could ask them what kind of considerations they think should be included or not included in rates, conservation, future planning, what have you. Um, and we could ask them sort of, sort of prioritization value questions about low bills now versus future planning and how do you balance those things. These are all just ideas um, that, that would give you a sense of how the community weighs these kinds of things. And then you might come up with different packages of ideas that weigh them differently based on what you've heard. Next slide. Um, so then that would happen, and then you have this interlude sort of December, January-ish. Um, timing is TBD, depending on how long it takes you in um, to come up with what your ideas are. That's why we're saying January, just to be on the outside. Um, so you'll develop one or more options. They'll be based on all the things that you've learned from staff and from your conversations with each, with each other. They'll be informed by those community preference and values that we'll get from the engagement. Um, again, it might be one option. It might be more than one option. And a single, what we're calling an option, you know, could be a package of ideas. It could be, you know, this kind of a rate structure with this kind of a planning for the future, with this kind of a thing and that kind of thing, um, uh, with where you've uh, toggled the pieces differently in different options. That's that sort of. Uh, that's why you might have multiple options because you have so many levers that we've identified that you can um, play with that might help you get to multiple options um, to run by the community and see what they think. Next slide. So then you'd have options and then we would take those options out, one or more options out to the community and say, so here's that list of interests that council was trying to balance with these ideas. Here's what the one or more ideas are. And for those ideas, we would ask the community, what do you like? What concerns do you have? What changes would you want to recommend to make each option better? And community members are so awesome at this kind of feedback. They're so thoughtful. And then we would also invite additional ideas. What interests or values are not fully addressed here or what additional suggestions or ideas do you have? And again, yard that all up and bring it back to you. So that's that second window of engagement. Next slide. So the question then becomes, wow, that sounds maybe super interesting, but what are the methods? And the methods become a much harder conversation now because of COVID like we talked about last time um, than perhaps we had hoped. Um, so thing one, we talked about putting uh, survey questions online in both Spanish and English. You post it on the website, you notice it in the utility bills. Um, we would also notice it in press releases and the weekly email that staff sends out and social media and all the things. So for some group of humans, that will be a great place for them to provide input and find information. Additionally, we thought we could do some of those virtual focus groups we talked about last time, uh, where we'd use the same kinds of questions from the survey, but dig in a little bit more to the why and what are you thinking and do more of a discussion, um, do it with residents and the business community, maybe target some specific groups, um, English and Spanish. I've learned that you have the Spanish, the, the capacity on staff to do some of these in Spanish, which I think is great. Um, we would wanna have a reservation requirement just so we didn't get 8,000 people in one, um, focus group because that wouldn't be very focusy. Um, the thinking is sort of 10 ish people for uh, per group doing um, at least five and more if time and interest is there. Um, and then we would really love it if once we get those set up, um, if um, one member of council would attend each one, just so you can do some of that hearing and learning of, of, of what comes out of those focus groups yourselves. But this isn't enough in part because of, of what we talked about last time was not everybody does the virtual thing. And so, uh, next slide. 
in person gets really hard. Um, so often, you know, in these things, we have people stand outside the grocery store. That's just not feeling safe and really uncomfortable. Um, I've learned that you have a habit, you have done in the past a telephone poll through an, uh, a contractor that does statistically verifiable telephone surveys. More people have telephones than have computers, internet, and all the things. So the hope is this might equalize a little bit of the demographic representation um, by doing the telephone model. They can do it, uh, the telephone polling in Spanish and English. Um, and again, we would hope that we would get an increased likelihood of, represent, of a representative sample of your community. Um, I'm gonna come back to this here in a minute, but go on uh, next slide, Julie. Some additional things to consider, again, COVID permitting, I would love to do in-person focus groups. I'd love to have you have staff get actual people together and actually have a conversation like we used to do in the old timey days. Um, and those could be place-based or group-based, you know, this part of the, of the city or this specific demographic. Um, and that would be make it easier to target underserved communities um, for that kind of engagement. Again, doing it in English and Spanish. Um, the COVID outlook does not look great for this, but it still is a thing that we could consider um, if uh, things change. And then some really targeted outreach to those underserved communities. Um, Growing Home um, is a partner with the city and does uh, has some relationships there. Um, and there are other organizations that, are, that my understanding is the city works with that you could leverage for that. Um, and then part of the conversation isn't just, hey, tell the people to engage with us, but rather, hey, Growing Home, this is a community you work with. What additional methods would you recommend for engaging these folks? Um, and then staff would proceed based on whatever those recommendations are. Next slide. Hey, that was the last slide. So here's the thing. This ends up being a really, really critical component of your conversation. Um, and if we wanna do these things, we kinda need to get after it right now. But the other thing is, given the, the range of perspectives on council and the range of perspectives in the community, I would hope that maybe a couple of you would be willing to sit down with staff and maybe uh, if there's going to be a telephone polling contractor, sit down with them to help frame up the questions so that we're sure that whatever comes out of this, you as council have confidence that it's balanced, that it represents the questions that you all have. Um, because I just made up what was on that slide. You probably have smarter and different and better ideas and we should you know, use yours and not mine. Um, so the primary questions for you tonight are, overall, does that sound like a, like a plan? Um, and if not, what would you like us to do instead? Um, and are there a couple of you that would be willing to sit down with staff and think through the specific details of it um, so that we, whatever happened, gave you confidence? What are your thoughts? Yeah, Dave. Cool. I'm just curious on this. Um, like, I, I like as many data points as possible so that we make sure that we're getting the different parts of the city. Uh, we have a very large, diverse city. Yeah. Um, but when you talk about the statistically valid survey, um, you know, I'd be curious the results of the phone ones we've done versus like when we do the citizen survey where they actually send out uh, postcards. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's something we've contemplated or what the cost would be for this. Um, but I mean, if, you know, I'd be curious the difference between those two things. Okay. So maybe that's some feedback from staff that we could gather. Yep, we can probably get you some information about that. Um, and if separate from the cost, if it was cost, permitting, would you want to do both of the things, the telephone survey and um, postcards, Dave, or would you think pick whichever one gets you the best representative sample and the most response? I, I'd be open to it. I think it would be interesting to be able to measure those against each other as well as measure them against the feedback that we get from our other data points. Um, I think that one of the um, I don't want to call it an issue because I am super glad that all the people who are diehard local government nerds like the seven of us show up to all, of the, all our meetings. Um, however, we do get kind of the rank and file people. And although we do want to hear from those people, we want to make sure that we're hearing from the people, you know, that are engaged in this and are affected by this that maybe don't nerd out as much as we do on local government. Lucky, lucky ducks that they might be. Yeah. <laughs> Other perspectives, council, yeah, Rich. 
As far as the survey too, and I, I agree with Dave that, you know, it'd be nice to see that balance between those two sides. Um, we all know about uh, telephone surveys and the lack of landlines now and, and how that weights that. But I, I'm also concerned as uh, how we can weight the surveys. Um, honestly, if, if we serve, if we survey a population that is primarily um, year, year round indoor users, they have a different perspective than those people who are at tier two and then at tier three. So there's got to be some consideration of, of waiting that way. And that's, you know, uh, the postcards can balance that and then, you know, the phone side can that so so that we can see those spectrums and then break that data down inside those. Fantastic. Yep, I think that's right. I think the other thing you could do to get at that is there's that maybe some demographic questions you could ask at the beginning to sort so you could know uh, what kind of water user it was. But I think maybe doing all those things would give you the most reliable data. Anita, what do you think? Oh, mute. Mute, mute, mute. Yeah, I'm not worried about if we utilize a firm that knows how to do statistically valid surveys that they'll figure out a way to do it and particularly wanting to make sure that we have the different types of water tiers is I think important to note, but I'm sure they'll figure it out. What I do have a little bit of concern with is, you know, ideally we would figure out like where are the guardrails and what we're asking the residents as a body after we've had these presentations. And so I'm a little uncomfortable with you deciding what the guardrails are on this because you brought up one thing like, hey, we're not gonna even bring up safe water because obviously we'll do that, but maybe we'll bring up future planning. And I would say to not consider future planning in our water plan, like that's all that's equally irresponsible and would put, I mean, so I, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable that our body here that I don't see Rich's voice or John's voice or my voice in in how we we make those constraints. Um, and I mean, I would hate to think, but I think it's it might be possible that if there was two or three of us working with staff on this, that might not give the confidence to the whole body. And I think for this exercise to be worthwhile, this whole body has to agree to at least like how we're doing community outreach. And so I just. I guess I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm trying to think about it. And then if I was going into a mechanic to get something fixed, I don't know if I'd ask all my neighbors like, hey, like where, are, I feel like I'd want to get the estimate from the mechanic, understand what are my three options, and then like talk with my husband, how are we going to get this fixed? Which one should we go with? I'm just a little nervous. I, I'm not sure. I really want, if we're asking people to spend their time filling out a survey or doing the survey on the phone, every single thing we ask them has to be relevant and actionable. Like we can't, I really don't want to take people's information and do nothing with it. Like everything we, everything we ascertain from that has to be able to impact our policy decisions. Um, and so, that was why I had kind of felt more comfortable with that one where we come up with kind of the three options and then communicate that and get an idea on the qualitative because I, I felt more comfortable. I'm, I'm happy to do this one, but I really want to be respectful of people's time and input. And, and I think I do believe every member on this council feels that duty of care and wouldn't want to have conversations which are like no more rate increases ever regardless of the consequences like that's I don't think any of us would be willing to like jeopardize our infrastructure and so I just I do want to make sure we're careful on the guardrails mm -hmm. so I think the question on that I mean if, if it makes more sense for all of you to be a part of that conversation um you know if you're going to so my advice would be if you're going to use the telephone polar to do the statistically valid thing that that's where you start and how are that person with their expertise helps frame the questions. Those become the questions that go into the other avenues of engagement. Um, and so if that, if you like those ideas, then I think, and, and you all would wanna be a part of that, then there's an additional conversation that we would wanna add where that person expertise human comes and chats with all of you, which might be an additional meeting. And again, I defer to your time and what your preference is, 
Um, but that's why I was thinking if there was a representative sample of you all that could sit down offline, that might be more efficient. But I certainly see your point is there's a there's a bunch of different views on this group of humans. So I get yeah, that. Too. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to uh, volunteer my colleagues for another meeting, but I just <laughs> I would want them all to feel comfortable. Like I would be worried if I was the one who volunteered to help staff that there might be some concern on some of their you know what I mean? I just want yeah. everyone to feel like it's their it's their process. Mm -hmm. What do others think? Yeah, Lindsay. I think this is it, it's and you're right. We did have a have a email exchange because um, I couldn't quite put my finger on how this was different than what was proposed in March in April ish uh, for going out to the public to uh explain rates and explain how we got here here um and and where we're going in the future um but this is a little bit more uh direction oriented which is is good um but i would have to agree i think um dave said this in the last meeting was not to rush um any of the conversations and the perspectives that we could gather from um from our community and i i agree i think that um this shouldn't be a rushed process um one of the concerns i think this has come up with um now multiple people um is is making sure that we solicit all and all who want to participate um because um it's my concern that um in these focus groups that there will be certain people that have been in focus groups before or have participated before um and not to say that their input isn't valuable um but to say that i i want to make sure that i'm making a well-rounded decision and hearing from all sides yeah. um and and with that said and, and i don't know if this is uh, an opportunity for council in the future or maybe a, a wiggle room in one of our um in one of our meetings but is there an opportunity to gather up past staff that has institutional knowledge of the data the cip projects they were part of to gather that history to really get where staff is now and where staff has been before. Um, is that something that maybe we could do to kind of like a Q&A with them? Because um, I know in my line of work, um, the people that have, and in, in Westminster, the people that work there work their years. And I'm not talking five, 10 years, I'm talking like 20, 30 years, which you can't write all that and have all of that in a documented process. And you mm -hmm. lose that as people leave. Um, and so I'm just wondering if it might be prudent of us to have that discussion with people that have that institutional knowledge that may have had a different perspective. I, that's my thoughts. I, I, I don't know myself the answer to your question, but we can we can chat about it and and, and see if those if there are such people if if other members of council want to add that to your docket. Um, but can I can I just come back on your community engagement stuff? Um, yeah. Uh, so, what is what do you, what would you suggest as a next step on that? And I guess I got to ask this of all of you, but I'll just start with 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 Lindsay because you were just talking. Um, given we don't want to rush it, um, but we also want to make sure that so if, if we're doing the front loading thing where you get their sense of you know preferences and such to inform your discussion, we would need to get about that relatively quickly, mostly so that you have that when it's time for you to have those conversations. I think it's, we have a couple of months doing engagement during you know November and December kind of takes longer just because the holidays and you don't want to be a complete, you know, we want to be respectful of people's time and their family time. So it would take longer because of that. So that's why I had the two months. Um, is that something that makes sense to you or does even that feel too rushed to get that front loaded stuff? Uh, the front loaded information. I, th I think that's okay. Um, I think we're, I don't know, we're landing in the, the budget process, like, right, that's driven by where we're at. And so um, I would assume that our deadline would have to be around June 
um, as far as really honing in on where we are uh, with our budget process for us to start then really diving into those conversations for a 2022 process. Um, so I know, I understand there's kind of a, a tight window, um, but I'm asking for <laughs> um, just Let's a start. longer process. Yeah, mm -hmm. just a longer process as far as like, I don't think it necessarily has to be two months. Um, if it takes longer and we feel like we have enough information, then we can move forward with that. Um, but I, if we're still kind of, I don't feel like I have enough information, maybe go into another month or two. Sure, and sort of do you know what we call adaptive management of the engagement process. Um, yeah, I think I think that is an overall strategy makes sense. What do others of you think about? Um, do you all want to be a part of helping inform what the questions and conversations look like, or could we pick two of you and maybe again two who have fundamentally opposing perspectives on this to help guide that so that the rest of you had confidence. Um, Yep, Anita. I'd be Anita. happy to do it. I'd be happy to help. Okay. Dave, what do you think? Um, I wanted to give a, a thought of what I don't want to happen in, in this. Um, I, I don't want it to be like, here's here's your three options. Do you want to pay a lot, a lot, a lot, or kind of a lot? Like I, I want I want some actual opportunity for some real feedback. Yeah. Um, I think that if you're going to have members of council and it's not all of council, you absolutely need to have um, some opposing views in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, and frankly, like what really would be valuable is to get some feedback from some of the concerns that we've heard from the residents over, you know, over this period of time where we've we've gotten to this point. Mm -hmm. um, you know in a way that we're saying okay well we understand you know you um you know this is too much for you guys to, to bear so what are some solutions you know and I, so i'm not exactly sure how you get at that but like i think we need a good mechanism to get good feedback and i i don't know what that is but i also don't want it to be just like i said like you know, here's your four solutions that really are kind of all the same thing. Right. Or yeah, small, medium, large of the single question. Um, yeah. I think that's why you'll come up with the ideas and that's why we're trying to identify as many levers as we can. So you can have slightly more complex and integrated questions. Herb, what do you think? Well, I had a couple of thoughts on my yeah. big thing was to engage as much with the public in person, understanding that with the numbers that we have seen, even just from last night till the, tonight, mm -hmm. went from a 395 to 4, 418 today. We are absolutely going 100 miles an hour the wrong direction. So we don't have any way to project when a set down capability with people to actually see them face to face. Yeah. We get more open dialogue typically there than we do with a survey. It's gonna happen. And if we need to defer in order to try to do that, I'm okay with that. But I will tell you, I think you're wasting your time if you try to get down to one or two council members to do this because you're not going to get full buy-in. Okay, I appreciate the honesty of that thing. Stop dancing around the subject. You have a split council, and if you don't get everybody's input, you're not going to get buy-in. Okay. So one option council is we don't take action on this right now and you carry on and maybe you'll have a better sense of what you want to know from people after you get through your rate conversation because i'm telling you it's a juicy one all that stuff that y'all want to talk about those are things the community wants to talk about as well you might have a better sense after that next one and if you're not concerned about the timeline um we can let it ride for at least one more one of these conversations and we can ask this question again my interest is making sure that you're getting what you need from the community at a time that is meaningful to both you and the community. So whatever you prefer is what we should do. Um, I don't myself anticipate having a role in this, so it's not relevant to me directly in any way. Yeah, Dave. Heather, keep in mind, this, these meetings is not just for council. That's why they're open to the public and the people are able to listen in and gain information that they don't know before. Right. So this is an education time for more than just the seven members. Okay. Yep. Okay. Dave? I, I just fully want to support what the mayor just said. 
okay. is, and I said this before, as far as like, I don't want to rush this. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, one of the things that has happened between our last meeting and today, and from even yesterday, today, to the mayor's point, is our numbers keep climbing. And I really want face-to-face um, -face, um, interaction. And that was, you know, part of the reason that I don't want to rush it. Earlier, when we talked about this before, I brought up the holiday season. So I still think that that's an indicator, but it's far less of an indicator than what's going on with COVID right now when you have, you know, one half of our city or more in a, a much more stringent um, situation than the other half, and the other half still going in the wrong direction as far as COVID is um, concerned. So I think that's a very valid point that, that the mayor makes. And I think, you know, I don't think it hurts to kind of slow on this. So given what I've heard, does it make sense that we will do the two rate conversations, one on water and one on wastewater, and then maybe have this conversation again and do nothing in the meantime? Is that your preference? I see at least four of you nodding. Yep. Okay. The rest of you, John, you can live with that. You didn't nod either way. You're... Do you want to share your thoughts just so we have them? See, I, I actually have a different opinion, I guess. I, okay. I don't want to rush things, obviously, but... I mean, people are very concerned about this right now. I, I, I don't want to drag it out. I think people need to express their opinions. We need to reach out quickly. And I, I don't, I, I actually feel differently than the group right now. I feel like people are pretty upset. I hear that regularly and I want to probably act on this sooner rather than later. I think we need to get their input and have a mechanism for them to communicate that with us now <clears throat> and as soon as possible, not postpone it until down the road. I, I don't think that, that, I don't support that, but I'll, Whatever the group wants to do, I'll follow that. So thank you. Okay. I, I, I think that, that John has a really good valid point and normally I would agree. I think my concern is, is, is I don't want to appear like I've seen some situations, not in this council, but in other councils in, you know, surrounding us where they've went through some uh, big decisions under these COVID constraints and, you know, it kind of, you know, it made people upset because they feel like, hey, I, I, I'm not, you're not accessible right now. So I, I agree with what John's saying as far as like, it needs to be addressed, but I also wanna make sure that it's accessible. So I don't know what the right in-between is, but I think I feel both ways. So like, I agree with what John's saying, but I also agree with the mayor. And, and again, I don't know what the right answer is and how we address it, but you know, they are both valid concerns. Mm -hmm. Um, Catherine, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I see where John's coming from. Um, and, and I agree that we need an answer quickly, but on the other hand, I want to be, I want to make sure that we're really listening to the public and we're in person with the public when we're listening to them. I've heard that over and over from the public. They want to be in person and they want to be able to talk to us in person. But this is not the time to be gathering in person with our numbers the way they are. Um, so, so I, I struggle the same way you do, John, um, which makes me think. But, but I think going slower um, makes more sense right now. I, I know it's not the answer everybody wants. Um, I don't know. It's it's tough, and I wonder, John, if 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 what the issue that you've raised is somewhat mitigated by the fact that we're entering into the fall. And I mean, granted, it was like 80 degrees in November last year, but that maybe the the impact that people are experiencing of water rates in this watering season will start to diminish as we go into the holidays, um, as the theor again theoretically as the weather cools, um, and so maybe that softens that impact a little bit and gives you a little bit more time. What do you think? Well, that's fine. I, th I mean, I think that the consensus of the group is kind of out there. I expressed kind of my thoughts, and I think it's not probably exactly in lockstep with the, the whole group, so I'll, I'll abide by the wishes of the group. So thank you. Okay. Um, so given that it's not perfect for all the reasons that you all have described, it sounds like the will of council at this time is to wait on this, get through these rate workshops, and then see where we are because then you'll know what you want to ask maybe you'll already converge on a couple of options and want to go right out and just get feedback on those options maybe you'll have a better sense of which of the levers are interesting questions which are you you really open to thinking about to anita's point um does that sound about right catherine 
Yeah, so so what you're proposing is that we basically go to through two more sessions and then we basically have this conversation again. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. And and so we have a session on November 5th and then mm -hmm. we have a session when's the session after that? I want to say the 17th of November, shortly thereafter. So and, it's about a month. And 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 here's my expect just I want to admit let you know what I'm expecting. So the way we have them scheduled is water rates, costs and rates for one and wastewater costs and costs and rates for one. And what I think is really going to happen is some of water costs and rates in the first one and the rest of water costs and rates, costs and rates in the second one, and then the wastewater, because the wastewater is mm -hmm. vastly more straightforward once we do all the other stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, then, then you're pushing up against Thanksgiving, right? So then whatever decision you want to, would want to make at that time about how to engage the community then is much more directly and critically influenced by the holidays but if 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 your hair is not on fire to get this resolved you know lickety split we have time to sort this out once you have more information after those discussions okay does that seem like an adequate plan given that it's imperfect and COVID is ruining all the good things yeah <laughs> anita I mean, I think it's fine. We spent 42 minutes now talking about this and I don't, I mean, I think the, the point that John brings up is a good one that like right now water rates is being, um, is a really divisive issue in our community. And there's a lot of claims that are going around that aren't accurate in regards to what even happened with our water rates, why they were done, where the money goes, all of these things. And so, you know, my hope is some of that immediacy that Don is asking for is being answered just through these sessions, mm. right? Um, and some of that, like me, that maybe will help diffuse some of the division within our community and people be like, wow, I don't agree with their choice, but at least I get that it wasn't like crazy, um, can happen, right? Okay. Like maybe that can happen or maybe people is like, understanding, thinking about, wow, my turn on my tap, I never really thought where the water comes from. There's a lot more that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that happens, but fundamentally we have decisions in front of us, right? And, and I just think that with COVID, <clears throat> with us not all being on the same page yet, with really truly wanting to have buy-in with this organization, with wanting to know what do we need to learn from our residents that, that's going to be meaningful to us, um, I do think we can wait those two weeks. Um, but I don't want to dismiss um, John's comments at all because I think they're really um, accurate. There's like pain in our community and division and confusion and um, people want an outlet for that, right? They need to express their frustration and, and I think I appreciate him wanting to, to provide that avenue right now, but I, I would remind anyone listening right now that you can partake the same way that Heather just read those questions that came in, that you can participate not in real time right now, but th those can be memorialized, brought back to us as council, um, and, and we'll be digesting them as we're having these conversations. And so maybe it's a yes and, I guess. Excellent. All right, council, any last thoughts on that? I really appreciate your commitment to this issue and to hearing your community and representing them. I I don't know if they know it, but I think they're lucky to have such a, just a, a honestly, I diverse councils, that's democracy at work. It just brings me joy. Nerd. Um, so coming out of this, it sounds like our plan is we're going to talk about rates um, and it's going to be so juicy. It's going to blow your mind. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Looking at you, all of you. Um, and that's at, at our next meeting. And then uh, wastewater will come after that. I think there'll be a pretty blurry line between those two. And at the end of those two conversations, we'll revisit this again. In the meantime, if you have additional questions that pop into your head, you should shoot them to me or to staff. Um, community members, again, you can go to the, uh, uh, to the website and there's lots of questions there. Or you, there's a comment form where you can put your questions in there. We'll do what we did today. Every meeting will capture what we've heard. Um, the summary of this of our previous workshop is also uploaded there. So you can look at that if you um, want to revisit the fun that was the first conversation. And we'll do one of those again um, for each one of these meetings. 
Uh, Anita, I haven't forgotten about your question to staff about if we can get some of this written in advance and what that might look like. Um, so we'll chat about that. And um, I think- We're those... almost as a recap, just mm -hmm. even if you can't do it in advance, summary of what the last two meetings yeah. are. That'd be cool. Technical, like technical, because I had a whole page of questions from the last one um, and looking at them, I was like, why was, why was I asking that? And- <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, yeah, so I think that I need to have that. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure out like what she on. used to be. I can't, I can't yeah. process, I can't retain it all, so. Fair enough. All right, anyone else have any last thoughts or requests before we send you back on your lives? Thank you for your patience and perseverance, particularly those of you who are ready for the cost conversations and thought this one was a slog. I hope you like the next one and I look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, be safe out there. These are tricky times. Take care.